Oh, I will say this: his he's probably done the greatest dunks of all time ask, of anyone like, ever. Mm. So if he says, "Well, I'm the greatest dunker," but it looks super cocky. I like my own dunk. <laughs> my <laughs> dunks are better than everyone else's. Why What's do you guys it? make them sound like that, though? Yeah. <laughs> Does it make a big difference for you? Have, can you notice it when you're huge, dunking? Huge difference. Um, the typically the worst surfaces to dunk on are sport court, uh, concrete, anything where you're like slipping on the floor. The best floors I've ever been on are NBA courts. Like by far, they I feel like they literally add vertical. Um, feels like there's springs on the on the mm. ground. That's fucking amazing. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Isaiah bad. was freaking out <laughs> <laughs> immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was crazy. There's, I saw that you chose to do like a leg extension to, to warm yeah. up. And I was just thinking that's an interesting <clears throat> movement because a lot of people trash sometimes the machines. I want to say like Brad Castleberry could jump really well. But What's so I funny? Would, I'm just smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I smile. He can't have a fake like vert, dude. Like that's got to be real. <laughs> 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 I've heard Tom Brady before because my hair would be oh, coiffed yeah. appropriately. You have a very <laughs> American yeah, look yeah, to you. Like, like a basic white guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no. like, oh, this is kind of sucks. <laughs> Tenons have a latent pain response. So you might not have pain during the activity, but the following day and even up to 48 hours after, your pain might skyrocket. I think they were trying to like eliminate the dunk from basketball, weren't they? I think in like college basketball. Yeah, in, the, in the 70s, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Would just crush everybody so bad. They were like, uh, I think all the little white guys were like, eh, excuse me, can we it's potentially like, change the rules? <laughs> You're not wrong. Probably some truth to that. That seems illegal. <laughs> what is the key like people listening they want to get stronger for jumping like we didn't haven't really knocked out like a couple of <laughs> a couple of uh you know let's start let's start out in the gym and then maybe you can give some other re reference points but like in a given workout and stuff how many jumps you know would you do if you are to be jumping in the gym in consideration of the fact that you're going to be playing basketball as well. Time for Smelly's tip. You guys ready for that? What does that mean? <laughs> All right, just let's yep, go. The most important go. segment of the podcast. <laughs> a little more spit, please. <laughs> Power Project family, how's it going? Now, on this podcast, we talk all about recovery, which is why eight sleep are the beds that we sleep on. Now, eight sleep is the Tesla of beds. Not only does it track your heart rate, your HRV, your tosses and turns, it also tracks how long you've been in each sleep cycle and the mattress does something amazing. It changes its temperature through the night to make sure that in each sleep cycle, you're getting the optimum sleep for you. Now, I know you guys are interested in checking them out, so head to eightsleep.com slash power project, and you'll automatically be able to save $150 off of your Pod Pro cover or your Pod Pro cover and mattress combo. Check them out. Enjoy the video. He doesn't want to mess up his polarity. <laughs> no. <laughs> He'll be all lopsided and shit when he walks on out of here, right? Mm -hmm. All right, whenever you're ready, Mark. Yeah, we're ready to go. Just, just, hit, just hit the fucking the button. button. Yeah. All right. Button's been pushed. Dude, what's up with uh, PR? I think kind of getting close to uh, PR range out there in the gym today, huh? Yeah, 10 pounds off. Uh, all the energy was getting me amped in there. You did about 285, was it? Yep, yep. Yeah, that's nice, 285 pound clean. You know, we have a lot of uh, a lot of athletes come through here. We have a lot of different people come through here, coaches and stuff like that. Um, and we have had some guys coming through like in their prime. But I think it's really cool when we do have someone in their prime that is actually, you know, practicing, you know, putting into practice a lot of things to not only make yourself strong, but also having the coaching behind you uh, where you're also making sure that you're not blowing yourself apart. Because so much of this game, whether you're trying to dunk, uh, in your case, with a 50-inch vertical, um, you know, whether you're whether you're dunking or trying to sprint or trying to, to uh, do jujitsu or run or whatever it is someone's trying to get into, it's not really what you can do so much as it is what you can recover from. And, like, what can you just brush off and be like, that wasn't that that wasn't that intense or that hard. At the same time, we have to find something that's intense enough to give us quality training. So it can be really difficult. So like for you guys, like how do you, how do you schedule out some of this stuff? How do you plan out? Like when you guys are talking about you going into like a dunk competition, um, right. I mean, everything must be talked about, even just you going to a basketball court and just kind of messing around. It's got to be examined a bit, right? Yeah. Do you want me to take this one? Or yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny you say that, like, 
even something as simple as just going to a basketball court can be stressful for me as a coach because I've, <laughs> I've seen so many times where Isaiah just shows up and he's like, hey, uh, went out to just shoot around for a little bit, ended up playing five games of pickup, Jesus. dunked a lot, and I sprained my ankle. And I'm like, oh, go figure. <laughs> like we were, we were laughing about it. He just did a contest and like, you know, I was, I was telling him, you know, this is what I want you to do for the session. Go in, do some drops, you know, depth drops to, to work on your landing. Maybe do 10 to 15 jumps. Isaiah's like, oh yeah, yeah, that sounds good, right? So I'm getting these texts during the session and I don't think anything of it. And then he like comes out of the session. And he's like, yeah, man, like check out these videos. Did you see that? Whatever. And he's like, hey, uh, you're going to want to watch this last landing. And I see him just roll his ankle and I'm like, oh, you've got to be shitting me. So then I see that. Wakes up the next day. He's like, yeah, it's pretty bad. I really can't walk. <laughs> I'm like, you, you're like, you're supposed to compete in like four days. Like this is not ideal. This was the recent one. This is the recent one. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I'm like, how many jumps did you take? And he's like, I don't know, like 55. I was like, it was 10 to 15. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was not a part of the plan, but getting into what you were asking, like in terms of the planning, you know, it, for me, it's always, especially in season, like the dunk season. I mean, when, when does that realistically run for you? Dunk season starts in the summertime and then it goes out to like the end of the year, January, February around there. Yeah. So, so it's so we got pretty, like nine months, nine months of dunk season. Yeah. So not for nine months of dunking, like, you know, if you're a, a power lifter or whatever else, you guys probably have a set competition you train for every year. Mm -hmm. You know, how many times a year do you guys peak realistically? Would you say in powerlifting? Uh, people that start to get to like a, a pretty high level, just maybe twice. Twice. Right. Yeah. So for him, it's like, every competition could have the same value depending on what the monetary compensation is if you win. And so it's kind of like, you mm -hmm. know, what I'm assuming in your, you do combat sports, right? Mm -hmm. How many times a year would you say you have to be ready to compete when you're a high level guy in combat sports? Oddly enough, all year long. Like exactly. I know a lot of com like a lot of uh, jujitsu guys that literally will have a competition every single month. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's similar to him where it's like, you never know when they're going to be, mm -hmm. you know, it's just someone reaches out to you like, Hey, you're ready to compete. And it's like, you always have to be ready. You can't really do those traditional like, hey, we're gonna have gym prep, then special prep, then specific prep, then pre-comp, then comp. Mm -hmm. It's like you're always functioning in those windows of opportunity. And so even coming here, it was like, okay, we know you're gonna have this competition on Tuesday. We know we're trying to plan out what days he wants to dunk, if we're gonna get on the on a certain court on a certain day, what we're gonna do for you guys. And we were kind of like, you know, asking you guys, we're like, well, what what do you guys want to do in the gym? Do you want to like? And so Zach's here, and he's like, well, let's let's just do a little power clean daily max. And I was like are you ready for a power clean daily max? <laughs> like, it's like, like everything's a daily max. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we'll just have to kind of plan, you know, retroactively a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Like I always say, write in pencil because you just never know what's going to come up. You always have to kind of be prepared to make those adjustments on the fly, you know, especially for him. So I guess, I don't know if I left anything else, if you had anything to add to that. No, nah, there, there's also a lot of planning that goes into, uh, depending on when I have to peak, uh, if I haven't dealing with any like injuries and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of it is just being in communication with John and discussing like, Hey, my body feels like this on this day. I got to do this tomorrow, this, the next day. And yeah, just keep going like that and always keep pushing. <laughs> that's, that's basically it. I saw that you chose to do like a leg extension to, to warm yeah. up. And I was just thinking that's an interesting <clears throat> movement. Cause a lot of people trash sometimes the machines. Yeah. Uh, there's people that are like uh, purists and they're like, ah, oh, functional movements only or whatever <laughs> yeah. that word even means really sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but why, why were you choosing to do that movement? Uh, that is for knee health. Those are called isometrics. We just get on a leg extension machine, uh, hold the weight up with one leg, hold that for 45 seconds. And that kind of warms up the knee and makes me feel a lot better. And we couple that with like slow squats or drops and that type of thing in order to warm up and be ready for a jump session. If I don't do that, like usually my knees can run into some issues. Um, but yeah, it's super important. Drops would be just dropping down from a box, like like standing on top of a box and then dropping yeah, down. Yeah. Like uh, we call them depth landings when we program them in. Uh, they can be anywhere from like 12 inches. And you want to match whatever your vertical is, go a little higher than that. So I'll go on a 50 inch box, jump <laughs> off of it. And trust me, you don't know how high 50 <laughs> inch vertical is until you're jumping off a box that high. You're like, and whoops. You, you feel it everywhere in your body. You're like, oh my God, we're not meant to be doing this. Wait, so do you drop off the box? Or do you jump off the box? 
it depends on my knee health. Like if I feel good, I just step off. If I'm outside and there isn't a box that's high enough, I'll literally just jump off, like jump up two feet in the air and land into the ground. John, are you aware of some of the work of uh, Jay Schroeder? Have you ever heard of that guy before? I have heard of Jay Schroeder. Yeah, oh, Jay that's... Schroeder to have people like jump off their garage <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and do all kinds of crazy stuff because the eccentric that or that landing you know, is a big part of it, but it's yeah. like, man, like now you're just talking about what can people survive? Yeah. Like a safety hazard. <laughs> like, uh, like we used to, it's funny when I first started coaching him, you know, in 2017 or 2018, that was like a big part of the process. And so Isaiah was living in a townhouse at the time in Florida and he didn't have access to the gym that he has now in Florida or had in Florida. And so he's like, Hey, so I, uh, I backed my car up you know, into like a field or something like that. I don't remember what the story was. And he's like, so I, I climbed on top of my car and I was jumping off the like trunk of my car because that was the only way I could get to 50 inches. That's great. Cause I, cause I the, like my goal with him was in that kind of ramp up was, well, if you can't even land from 50 inches, you sure as hell shouldn't be trying to jump, you know, apply force in an elastic manner, exploding upward this far and landing in a haphazard position from 50 inches. Like yeah. there's, we should do a little bit of prep uh, so I heard that and I was like, damn, I was like, I thought a 36 would be like 36 inches would be enough. And now I guess now you more or less just jump off of like, he can, yeah. you don't always, always have access to a 50 inch box. Mm -hmm. So what do you, I guess, what do you do now? Um, jump high off yeah, of a box? Pretty, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I literally just jump off, off into the air and land on the ground. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just depends on, on what I got access to. Have you guys found anything with like landing on something soft from there? Like, is that helpful or is that like not what you're after because you want that kind of crash landing? Yeah, I think, I think that there's different times where you would want different types of surfaces. So I'm a big research guy. I love looking at data and stuff. And, you know, if you were to put Isaiah on a force plate, right? And force places are force plates are very, very stiff, right? And you can have embedded force plates. You could put a mat over a force plate. You could probably put a fake turf over force plates. Like I think in the Middle East, they have literally entire soccer fields where force plates are underneath it mm. and they're able to look at every contact. And so that being said, like you would actually be able to see the changes in those peak forces and how you would distribute, you know, that force time curve and how the forces would change. And there's certain times where I want to take advantage of that, right? Like, an athlete like Isaiah, where he's such a high level, I might want a more stiff surface because I want to see higher peak forces and I want him to be prepared if he's going to jump on concrete, if he's going to jump on plywood, if he's going to jump on something that's less, you know, compliant. Because if I was saying this earlier, like the surface on an NBA court is souped up. Like there's like two major companies. I don't, I don't remember exactly. I think one is like Robertson flooring systems and like another one that is used by the NBA. And they have tiers. You can go on their website and there's like four tiers of these of these courts. The NBA gets obviously the most souped up one that's like going to maximize your ability to safely land. And it's also going to give you the greatest performance improvement. Mm. And so for him, it's like, well, obviously we don't have access to that. You know, not all the time. And he, sometimes he's dunking on what is the shittiest flooring you could possibly think of, right? Mm. Like just tiles that slide or, you know, whatever else. Sport and so, court. yeah, sport court. Is just not the best. Does it make a big difference for you? How, can you notice it when you're huge, dunking? Huge difference. Um, yeah. The Typically the worst surfaces to dunk on are sport court, uh, concrete, anything where you're like slipping on the floor. The best floors I've ever been on are NBA courts, like by far. they. I feel like they literally add vertical. Um feels like there's springs on the, on the mm. ground. So that makes a huge difference. So yeah, in short, we definitely use different flooring. I think most of the time it's what you have. If it is a really soft compliant surface, like if he was like, I only have sand, I'd be like, drop off a 70 inch box because mm -hmm. sand is more like, it's going to be far more forgiving than yeah, you land on concrete. Is it helpful for like track athletes? Like they land in the sand pit a lot. Like, is there any research or information on so, those landings and what that transfers into the body? I mean, I would imagine the absorption's less, but right. maybe you can do more and because you can do more, maybe... Yeah, I think I definitely think there's a psychological portion to it. Like I wouldn't look at the landing and long jump just because the way that they land is almost on their butt or whatever else. Like you're going to get a pretty cushioned fall. But I mean, just in terms of how that's changed over the years, like high jump is I was a high jumper. I loved high jump. I coached coached track uh, at Duke and I coached high jump there. And uh, when I was there, like, you know, I got really into the the history of the of the event. Right. And so they used to have just sawdust. Well, when they had sawdust, no one wants to do a backflip on a sawdust, right? And so as the event changed, you know, the technique changed and guys became more confident and psychologically, you know, now I know I'm landing on a mat. If I know I'm landing on a mat, like, yeah, I'm sure shit gonna run 
you know, what is equivalent to an 11 second, hundred meter dash full speed, plant my foot in the ground and do a backflip onto it. Like if I know I'm landing on sand or, or sawdust, there's no way in hell I'm going to commit to such an aggressive approach. So mm -hmm. I think that's probably the biggest difference. Um, in terms of like, as a training stimulus, we don't really use sand too often. Like we passed a dune on the way we were, we were coming up, you know, from, from LA here and there was a giant dune and he's like, Oh, look at all the, the footprints. And like, people do that all the time. They do a lot of sand running and stuff. That's really stressful on your connective tissue on your feet actually. And so I think it has a place, but it's like, you'd have to put it at the right time of the year, I think. And at least what I would do, um, like my old mentor, Mike Young, he used to do it with his athletes in the gen prep season because it's a soft surface as he gets closer to the season. Okay. Now let's get on harder surfaces, right? Where we're going to see higher peak forces, higher speeds, higher velocities, like all across the board. Um, so I would kind of use the surfaces in that way, like periodizing them, I guess, or planning accordingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious about this because both of you guys can dunk, right? <laughs> okay. Yep. So Isaiah, I asked you something in the gym earlier and it was kind of surprising. You said you weren't always able to jump like the, no. like, you know, you didn't always have hops. So what, like, when did that occur for you? When did, what changed in your training that I know there's a lot of things, but that allowed you to get to the level yeah. where you're at now. So I actually started off my athletic career playing basketball. Uh, I always describe it as that was my first love was basketball. Yeah. And I played until I started playing when I was nine years old. And then I hit my first dunk when I was 16 years old. And I was actually cut from my high school team three times for being too short and unathletic. So uh, yeah, they didn't, they didn't have a, a big base of, of athleticism there. Uh, Did you ever finally make the team? <laughs> <laughs> I d so I moved, I ended up moving to Florida for my <laughs> senior year and I finally made the team. Uh, nice. As far as how I got into dunking, I was always dunking on low rims. Like I'd go to basketball practice and then I come back home. That's more my speed. <laughs> <laughs> I'd lower the hoop to like eight feet, nine feet, and I would practice on there. Yeah. And then that just jumping every single day, I was eventually able to get my first dunk. And then a couple months later, I windmilled. Then I found yeah, a, a couple YouTube. months later, you windmilled. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, his yeah, progress yeah. was not normal. <laughs> <laughs> so I found a YouTube channel called Dunkademics around this time. And there was a all these crazy dunkers like Jordan Kilgannon, uh, T Dub, Air Up There. Whoa! Oh my God. <laughs> 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 Holy shit. Yeah, was that on the 10 foot rim? You went behind the back. Yeah. All like these, over the shoulder. Yeah, oh all my these, God. All these are no. 10 feet. So I found this YouTube channel with all these pro dunkers and I started practicing all those trick dunks uh -huh. on the low rims. I learned the technique for them. And then eventually I was just able to bring them to a, to a 10 foot, a 10 foot court. Um, but yeah, I was, I had to work for a lot of that bounce. And when I was around 2017, I met John and he's kind of the person that took my vertical to that, to that next level. But yeah, I, I wasn't always, uh, had this athleticism. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's pretty wild. Did what you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, did, when you started working with them in 2017, because you've worked, you, did you work with other dunkers prior? So it's, it's actually a funny story how I got into that niche because most people are like, how <laughs> it's funny. I, I, I've told people this, I like go on, can you imagine going on a date? And they're like, so what do you do for work? And you're like, <laughs> oh, I teach people to dunk. And women are like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and I'm like, it is what it is. <laughs> but so how I got into the, the niche is basically, I loved it myself. Like I dunked for the first time when I was 14 or 15. Wow. Yeah. yeah. How tall are you? I was five ten at the time. Now I'm. You about sound six like foot. you were a beast when you were. A I kid. was a I mean, monster. Not, not that you're not yeah. now, but you said you were squatting like three plates and yeah. stuff, and so, you were lifting heavy and stuff like that at a young age. Yeah. So when I was thirteen, I was like obsessed with training. Like, uh, so I we had basketball, and I, so I switched schools from like this small school to a bigger school, and you know I'm like in seventh grade, and someone all the kids are trying to touch the rim or whatever else, and like I was never naturally gifted at anything. I have a twin brother. He, he destroyed me in everything. He was mm. a better basketball player than I was. He was faster than I was. The only thing that I ever had on him was jumping. Like the mm. one time we're like, Hey, could you, you know, the little orange block under the rim. They were like, Hey, do you think like you are like trying to jump and I, I get really high on the net. And then they're like, do you think you can touch the block? And then I was like, I don't know. I've never tried. So I go up at like 13 and I touch the block and everyone's like, holy shit, he touched the block. Like, is it Vince Carter? I was like, <laughs> I was like no, not, not quite. That's not going to be the case. That's amazing. <laughs> and so, so after that, I was like, that was the only time in a sport where I would have like had a little bit of like attention for something I could do. And I was like, oh, like this is kind of fun. So I joined track just thinking like, oh, I just want to do it to dunk. And so I'm like, I'm going to do high jump. So that first year I jumped like five foot or five, two as a 13 year old, which is pretty good. 
And I was like, the next year, you know, I'm like kind of developing, you know, maturing, going through puberty. I go from like 110, I think it was 110 at the beginning of my seventh grade year to like 135. By the end of my eighth grade year, I was 145. During that time, I started doing plyometrics. I started squatting pretty heavily, started dabbling with deadlifts, but I was never good at them. So I remember I was like 14 or 15 and I'm just like, how many plates? It wasn't like for me, you know, it's like, how much do you bench? Yo, what's your bench, bro? Like that wasn't it for me. It was like, what's your squat? (laughs) I was like, how much can you squat? And so I was like, I want to get as high as I can. So I did three plates, like 315 down to like a half squat or something at the time, which like, you know, we were, we were testing my hip mobility. It's, it was better then than it is now. Um, but I started to have back issues and all this stuff. And I just mm. became obsessed with training to dunk. So like 14, I was getting the ball above the rim, almost dunking. 15, wow. I was like, at the end of 14, I dunked for the first time in front of practice. Like I was 15, one of the, eight, like you were mixed between eighth and ninth grade. This kid's like, hey, uh, Evans, you think you can dunk now? And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I go up and I just like punch one and everyone starts throwing the ball off the wall. They're like, holy shit, it is Vince Carter. <laughs> like they, they were just mind blown. <laughs> and then after that, like, so yeah, I was like a man child at the time. And then it's funny because Isaiah's like, it took me one month to do a windmill. It took me literally <laughs> 10 years to get my first windmill after that. I didn't windmill until I was 25 holy for the first time. Shit. And Isaiah was there. He actually saw that session. Yeah. And now like I've just slowly, slowly progressed and like, Dunking as a sport in general has changed. Like, we'll call it a sport now because guys are competing. We're, we're trying to push into the Olympics. It's changed so much. Mm. Like, wow. when we were in eighth grade, there was YouTube videos that you could watch. You could look up Team Flight Brothers. And he would, this guy named Chuck, who's a friend of ours, would just post these videos of dunking. And so that's all that was, my exposure was to it. Mm. And so I never thought, like, this is going to be a sport. This is going to be something that's going to grow. I'm going to do high jump or track because I could get scholarship money or whatever else. Turns out the sport is grown just progressively over the last 10 years since my first dunk or 15 years since my first dunk almost. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's pretty much where I was at at the time. And my progression is really interesting. It's super slow. I'm probably going to hit the first between the legs when I'm 30. <laughs> and that dunk is a very technical dunk, especially for someone that's six foot. For me to do it at 30, that's unheard of. How old were you when you did your first between the legs? I was... 16. It was a year after I hit my first dunk. I I did a between the legs dunk for the first mm. time. Yeah. So his wow. progress was like this. It was like nothing, nothing, everything. For <laughs> me, it was like pretty good, nothing, and then a little bit better like over time. Yeah. Um, just like very, very slow progress. Uh, some of that was injuries, you know, learning. A lot of it was learning. I think, honestly, a lot of the, you know, how I got into the sport was by just trying it. And there weren't, there weren't people, there weren't pioneers that were really teaching us Someone that's a huge pioneer in the sport is a guy named Jordan Kilgannon, and he was a mentor and inspiration yeah. for you, I would so say. Yeah, so Jordan Kilgannon, he's actually the person that got me into professional dunking. He's the first or second pro dunker that I found out about of. First was Kadoor. Um, But I was at school. Um, I was able to do like one-handers, two-handers at the time, and I saw a video on YouTube of him doing a dunk called The Crown, and it's where he jumps over someone and puts both his elbows in the rim backwards. <laughs> and I saw that and I was like, whoa, this guy is a freaking beast. And I started like, I asked for advice on how to how to do a dunk on low rims. And he hits me back on Facebook with like paragraphs of advice on how to do the on how to do the dunk. Yo. I go straight outside to practice the dunk. I hit it. I text him. And then from there he was like, yo, you have potential to do this at a world class level one mm. day. Uh, let me let me teach you everything I know. From there, I started Googling everything about Jordan Kilgannon. I found an article by Just Fly Sports. And in the article, it says that he got to the level where he's at by jumping every single day for multiple hours a day. There were some days he would dunk for seven, eight hours. He would bring like his food to the to the basketball court and he would just be there <laughs> dunking all day. And then I saw that and I was like, okay, I think this is the secret to jumping <laughs> higher let me practice jumping every single day mm-hmm. and see see where I can take it. Mm-hmm. So so actually, with your early progression, because you do a lot of lifting, you're a super strong yeah. dude, but with your early progression, were you literally just going out to the court and jumping and jumping yep. and from, jumping? From age 16 to 18, I was jumping every single day to see progress. I would rest after like two weeks for like a weekend and my vertical would like shoot up a little bit. And I just repeated that process for a couple of years but the downside to that is I ran into my good friend, patellar tendinopathy, jumper's knee, and I just couldn't keep that pace of dunking up anymore. And that's where I met John. Well, I started lifting when, when that started happening. I met John probably two years after uh, I started lifting and had like jumper's knee. 
Um, but throughout this whole process, I was I was weight training a lot. It's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah, I think uh, you know the ball, right? It gives you a distraction. You know, like it gives you like yeah. people aren't thinking about speed when they're going out and uh, just throwing around a football. Yeah. But like to get under the football, you're going to have to speed up a lot. And to dunk a basketball, like you got to produce a lot of force. Like mm -hmm. something, something has to happen in order for you to dunk yeah. the ball. And so I think it's, it's you're training for uh, this peak performance without even kind of recognizing because yeah. you're just playing around with some friends and stuff like that. So when I first started weightlifting for for dunking, it actually started weight training for basketball. I lifted from for like two years, I think, uh, just to get stronger for basketball. And I did starting strength by Mark Ribito, mm -hmm. just three by five, everything, squats, <laughs> deadlifts, power cleans. And I got to the point where I was squatting like two plates. Uh, I could power clean like 185. I was benching similar to my power clean. How old are you at the time? Uh, 17 years old around there. And then from there, I took a short break from lifting. And when my knees got really bad, found John and he kind of taught me better methods to weight train, how to periodize stuff, how to deal with patellar tendinopathy. And then now I kind of use like more like load management and stuff like that to get better. What's funny, I never answered your question earlier of how I even got into that. Mm -hmm. That's how I got into it was Isaiah reaching out to me. <laughs> so he was your first dunker. He was my first, my second actually. Second, my first dunker is a guy that actually does a lot of sales for us in our, in our business DHP. The second guy was Isaiah because his best friend is our good friend, Austin Burke. And so Austin, it's funny. Austin was like, oh man, I really want to, I want to come out, but I'm really nervous. I don't know anything. Like, but Austin was really like a pioneer for me getting into the sport because I was at the time doing one handers and I was like, why can't I do a windmill? And Austin was like five, nine Austin Burke. If you can look him up, mm -hmm. he's, his stuff is really impressive. So he's doing windmills and he's 17, 18 years old. And yeah, he, he was doing dunks better than me. And I was like, there's no way that my 10 plus years of formal education that have taught me how to train, why, why is he better than me? So I start talking to him and then he's like, man, you know a lot about training and jumping. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, do you want to coach me? I was like, for sure. So within the first couple months, he trains his ass off and makes a ton of progress. Mm. And then Isaiah is his good friend. And I guess you can pick up here what happened there. Yeah. So wait, where, where did we leave? Oh, we <laughs> I was saying, I was saying I started coaching Austin and he was making a lot of progress. Okay. Okay. And then I guess you so, saw it. I don't know. Yeah. So I met, I met Austin, uh, in Florida and we were just doing like dunk sessions together, playing basketball together. And then he tells me about this guy that he got on a phone call with. He's like, bro, this is the smartest person I've ever met with for dunking and basketball. Like you got to talk to him. Like just, just get on a call with him and you will understand what I'm talking about. And I'm like, all right. And at the time, I was really skeptical of anything that's like jump training programs and stuff like that. And I get a FaceTime from this guy. His name's John. And mm. I saved this contact as uh, John Jump Einstein. That's what I, <laughs> that's what I put him on. There. <laughs> and he starts talking to me and he's like, hey, like um, I've been training Austin for a couple months. Like I think Austin ended up getting a college scholarship for, uh, for high jump for, for or high a jump. long jump or something at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So he improved a lot under him and he was my best friend. And I was like, oh, like. Like, what's the, what's the secret? Like, teach me. And then he started, uh, John started telling me that in dunking, all the dunkers were so naturally gifted and weren't really training properly as far mm -hmm. as like, like track stuff and weight training. And then he told me, he's like, imagine if you got somebody that had a ton of potential, someone like Jordan Kilgannon that doesn't weight train properly. If you put them under like proper, like sports performance training, what would be possible for them to achieve? And I was just like, sign me up. Like, <laughs> I'm ready. Like, my knee's a little messed up right now. Like, we'll just take care of that. And then... The tendinopathy? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we'll take care of that. And then, like, like I'm going to full send it. Let's see let's see what we can do with that. So, yeah. if you want to give, like, your perspective on the call. Yeah, so basically, like, I mean, at the time, I had no no clout, no following. I had, I had some pretty good internships. I did an internship with a group called Altis, which was previously called World Athletic Center under a coach named Dan Paff, who's like a legendary track coach. Coach Donovan Bailey, my mentor before that was a guy named Mike Young. He's, you know, an unbelievable just scientist, biomechanist, coached at LSU when they won all these national championships in track. So I'm really formally trained as a track coach. That's pretty much what a, you know, what my experience was. I had a lot of experience lifting myself, doing plyometrics, you know, training underneath these guys for for years. And so Isaiah is the first big time athlete that I've personally ever coached because when you're in strength conditioning, and, and I'm sure you guys probably have seen this or know this, you're like 
a little drone. You just walk around and wake up early, set up the cones, set up the weight room, clean, and you got to put the time in. That's what you have to do. But I had never had the opportunity to take the reins on a super high level athlete. So Isaiah, I don't even know if you know this, coming into the call, I was freaking out. I was like, oh my gosh, this dude has like a 45 inch vertical. He's one of the best in the world. He's one of the fastest growing pro dunkers. He's going to be a freak someday. But I had to have that kind of inner confidence to say, yeah, he's done that. But I've also worked with Andre de Grasse and he's got a silver medal in the Olympics in the 200 meter dash. And mm. I've also worked with Greg Rutherford and he's long jumped 832 and, you know, eight meters, 32 centimeters in long jump. And so I think that kind of calmed me down a little bit, but going into that conversation, I was a little bit nervous. And then, yeah, he starts talking to me and I was, Honestly, I just rambled. Like I was, I was like, well, you gotta do, you gotta do a power lifting or are you gonna do like just, all these power lifts? You gotta let do, it, do, not at all out. Yeah, I was just, <laughs> I just was like, <laughs> so I just rambled and Isaiah is super skeptical just in general as a person. And there's so much misinformation in jump training. There's guys that are like, this is the one way to, and this is the one. And it's like, there's really not one way. There's a proper way to train, you know, but they, there was a lot of misinformation. And so he's quizzing me basically. It was like, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And so I was fielding all of the questions and there was no hesitation. It was like, well, no, it's gotta be this way. And it's gotta be this way because X, Y, and Z. And Isaiah, I think at that point was like, okay, he's not just a bullshitter. He's not just making shit up or pulling shit out of his ass to be like, oh, this is the way it is. <laughs> like he was very skeptical and then was willing to basically be like, look, I have a, one more shoot. I gotta do this power ride thing. And then I'm willing to work with you, but my knees are really messed up. And so during that time, I think there was maybe like a two or three month lull between yeah. After that conversation? Yeah, it was uh so every year there's a thing called Dunk Camp. Um they it's like the biggest dunk event for every every single summer. And there was the first one in 2018. And I think that was like 2 months away and then I start working with John and my knees were really messed up and I had 6 weeks to get ready for that. So mm. it was 6 weeks of no jumping, just focusing on how how am I going to survive Dunk Camp? Yeah, because at this point it's like you're going to have to jump for three days or four days straight. Mm. Our goal is you're going to jump. I would have to keep telling this. I'm like, if you're in pain, because at this point I've partially torn my patella, my patella tendon, not my, not the, when I say patella shorthand for patella tendon, I had partially torn it on a takeoff. I didn't have health insurance at the time. So I was like, well, I got to figure this out myself. So I just started diving into all the research and I'm like, I got to find what the PT would do or find what the doctor would do. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, oh, well, there's cross massage and there's all this other stuff. So I end up finding, you know, a, a concrete way of doing it through just diving down that rabbit hole. So I apply it with myself and lo and behold, it works. And I was like, this is amazing. It actually worked. So Isaiah's like N number two, like second subject in this study <laughs> and he does it. And we have this buildup, this ramp up and he gets to dunk camp and it's like crushes it, like has a little bit of pain. We managed through it. And then after that, it was like, okay, we, we fixed you. Pop the fuck off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there was a little bit of a lull between that. And then I started switching from, okay, let's get you from not walking down the stairs without like walking down the stairs with pain. Let's, let's remove that from your life and take you to the best dunker in the world. Like let's get you to a 50 inch vertical, a 51 inch vertical. And he had never trained formally. So for me, it's like, all right, I have this clay. I have to be careful with it because he has had injuries in the past, big ones, you know, really, really bad ones. I need to keep him healthy, but I also need to train him properly, you know? And I'm sure again, you guys probably, we were talking about it before the podcast. It's like, you know, you have these power lifters that at 18 years old, they have back pain or knee pain or hip pain or whatever else. Same thing's true in our sport. You know, I had jumper's knee when I was 14 years old. Mm. I ended up tearing my shit when I was 23, 24. And it's been a, a constant journey to figure out, okay, how do I keep getting better, you know, into my thirties or whatever else, which I'm sure everyone wants, to, no one wants to get worse, mm -hmm. but also stay healthy. So, you know, that was pretty much the journey of how we met. And then when we started training after the first three months, he tested 43 or 44 at dunk camp. Was it yeah, 44.5? Uh, 44.5. Yeah. Was so that just straight standing or was it uh, approach? It's running, an approach. Running. There's actually, there's a video, I think, is it on THB Strength Instagram? Yeah. Yeah. It's on THB Strength. So if you can, uh, if you can find it, you can see his progress video at that. You can see the first jump at camp when he touched, I think it was like 11.9 or something like that. He didn't get any taller. His reach didn't change or whatever else. I guess you weren't fully reaching maybe at the time when you tested. I don't remember what the deal uh, I was. I don't remember. But he touched 11.9. <laughs> And then, you know, next year with, or within three months, we got him touching about 12 feet. So it was like that quick <laughs> he improved. I think something that's really awesome about this is that <laughs> maybe with uh, basketball and maybe in particular when it comes to dunking, 
it would be very hard to give athletes uh, advice because there's been this long history of people just probably figuring it out themselves. And uh, maybe you never heard about a particular way that Vince Carter trained or Jordan trained or maybe any of these guys, or maybe those guys made it really far without any real particular training. It's, it's rare for an athlete to stop or for like, I commend you especially because at such a young age, to like, you know, want to get that help and seek that help. It sounded like you were kind of painted it into a corner and so you kind of needed it too, but most people won't do that. Most people won't recognize like, okay, I recognize I have these talents here, but there is probably someone that can help me get to the next level. It, it's very rare for someone to be, for someone to have that much humility to do that. And the only thing I can think of that's like remotely close to it is when Brazilian Jiu Jitsu got to be really popular. Because when the UFC came around and they had all these guys, they all thought they were tough. They all thought they could fight. And before that happened, before, I mean, the people in jiu-jitsu, even 20, 30, however many years ago you want to go back, that jiu-jitsu has been around for, which is probably a long time. Those people knew, but the rest of the world did not know that jiu-jitsu was a way, like a clear path to being able to defend yourself really, really well, especially against larger opponents. And Hoist Gracie kind of, he had to show everybody, he had to physically show everybody, like, check this out. This shit really works as he, you know, wiped the floor up with three, four, five guys every night for a handful of years. Was that in the UFC he was doing? It that? was in the UFC. And I remember the first two or three UFCs, I cannot remember the announcer's name, but the announcer knew what was up because he was a former wrestler. I think he did some grappling and I think he had some experience with jujitsu. <clears throat> And he kept talking about Hoist Gracie and how how great he's going to do. And I'm like, this guy's not going to do. You kid, you kidding me? Like this guy is so skinny compared to Tank yeah. Abbott or compared to <laughs> some of these other guys that you see. So in sport, it's like until it like physically happens, a lot of people aren't willing to uh, go and get the help or to recognize there is a better way. And a lot of times when it comes to athletics or it comes to being the athlete sometimes all that you need is just somebody to kind of pull you back a bit and say, well, let's try to, let's try to make this a little bit of a system. Okay. You want to play every day. Okay. If you want to play every day, well, then we got to be careful of how many jumps you do. Yeah, or right. how about you jump as much as you fucking want, but you can only go twice a week or yeah. whatever the compromises <laughs> yeah. are that you, you have right. to try to make. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good way to, to put it. Like, I think a lot of the time we get one of the, with him, him, he was one of the, the people that was saying, I need to jump every day. And I'm thinking, there's no way. There's, I'm sorry. We got to make a compromise somewhere because if you keep doing this, you're going to, eventually it's going to catch up to you or, or at this point it already has. So we have to pull some of this away, adjust some things and come back. But to his credit, like you said, the humility to be able to accept the help. That's incredible. I mean, yeah. At such a I young was, age too. I, I would have been like, coach, I don't I need this coach. Give me a break. <laughs> exactly. I'm already dunking like a madman. And I need this to be fair, that had happened to me numerous times. And that is currently where we are in our business right now with NBA players. That is currently where we are. We have had NBA players reach out to us and say, what's the secret? What's the key? And for me, Isaiah's always like, well, what's the next step for, for you as a coach? And I'm like, that's the next step. I need to get that one NBA player that wants to commit and wants to dive into this. I can really picture, great. I could picture you going to like a game or, you know, you got a moment with some NBA guys and you're like, you just nod to yeah, Isaiah, hey. Isaiah. <laughs> and hey. just like, bam. Hey, yeah, go show them how it's go ahead, And go, then they're go, like, take the ball. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny. We were at a facility called OT and Isaiah couldn't go to this, you know, the, one of the outings that we did. And we were working with these OT is like this giant high school facility in Atlanta. They're currently like pro high school players going to the NBA. I don't know if you guys, are you guys familiar with OT overtime? I'm elite? not. Oh, overtime athletes? Over, uh, overtime, not those guys. Not overtime those Overtime elite. So they're, okay. it's, it started as a media company, kind of like Ball is Life or mm. like our friend Dunkademics. And then they just kind of molded into doing this now. So they have this huge facility in Atlanta. They, they took all these high school players and they brought them in and they paid them to play. And they're basically like broadcasting this on YouTube and trying to grow it, you know, and, and basically say, hey, look, high school players should get play should get paid. We'll pay them. Mm -hmm. We'll take that, you know, risk of whatever. I don't know what the business model is, but we, we got brought in to help them learn how to dunk. And so we're in the like intro kind of talk with all these 17, 18 year olds who think they're the shit. They're like, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm the best high school player in the country. Like these guys should bow down to me or whatever else. And then CJ is this very humble, quiet, kind of six foot skinny kid. And like, 
you know, he's, he's saying like, you guys can do so much more and we're kind of hyping them up. And then we go into the first dunk session and CJ, CJ champion, you should, you should pull up some of his stuff. He is a freak. This kid, Isaiah and him used to compete. They both ironically grew up in Florida. Yeah. Didn't know they both lived there. They're about the same age. The fuck's in that water, man. Mm. I do, there is something in the water <laughs> in Orlando. We have seen it so many water, times. Man. There's so many freaky they athletes in Florida. got all those gators and they got yeah. all those boa constrictors Woo! and Yeah, this shit. is CJ. So yeah, CJ- we've, we've seen him before. CJ's fucking nasty. Yeah. And CJ comes up oh, and he shit. punches that. <laughs> he did that. Oh, 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 oh. So, so he does that one-hander. And literally all the guys, their jaw just drops to the floor. And I was like, that is why we are here. <laughs> like, so that was probably the closest we've ever gotten. But hopefully someday we'll kind of bridge that gap and be able to, to work in that. I think people think we're just a specialist at this. But in reality, it's, it's all the same, just different directions. You know what I mean? It's just power displayed in a different direction, just God vertically damn. versus side to side or whatever else. Greatest dunk of all time. Greatest dunk? What is the greatest dunk of all time? Yeah, what one? What one? Like, <laughs> I'll answer this you because Isaiah can't. <laughs> what? What? What gives you guys like chills or goosebumps, or you get so pumped where you're like, "Fuck, man, I got to get it back out there and dunk." Oh man, it's it's so individual for everyone. I'm and sure Isaiah, you can, but you can pick more than one. Isaiah mm-hmm. doesn't want to answer because he would. I will say this: his he's probably done the greatest dunks of all time ask, of anyone like, ever. Mm. So if he says, "Well, I'm the greatest dunker," it looks super cocky. I like my own dunk. <laughs> <laughs> my own dunks are better They're than awesome. everyone else's. <laughs> Why do you guys make him sound like that, though? <laughs> yeah. I know he's got a beautiful <laughs> voice. <laughs> it's very soothing. Um, so I would say my favorite that he's ever done, and the the other thing you have to remember is that the increment of one or two inches on a rim height changes things massively. And it's a, it's a current debate and an argument right now in the sport. You know, everyone wants to be super legit, but the reality is if you go to a 24 hour fitness, your expectation, if you're one of us, is that the rims are not 10 feet. You'll measure them. They might be nine, 10 and a half, nine, 11, right? It might be nine, 11 and a half. It might be nine, nine. And so Isaiah and a nine, nine rim versus a 10 foot rim unlocks mm infinite more dunks three inches really three inches is a lot oh hey. <laughs> hey, <laughs> okay yeah. hey now so if you that that difference in that rim height it just it unlocks an arsenal of dunks that are their video game level like if you look up 360 behind the back between the legs i would argue this is the greatest dunk that's ever been done ever you know and isaiah you've done it on what height rim have you done that on Nine nine and three quarters. Nine nine and three quarters. So he's if to make it like legit legit of legit, obviously we want to do ten. And so that's why we're looking at this NBA mm. court in Sacramento Kings. Like I was saying, mm. those floors are souped up. We're like, oh, <laughs> if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen there, you know. And so yeah, that ooh. dunk, it's like on ten feet. I would say the greatest. Oh, this is the nine nine one. He's done it on nine ten cents. Mm. I think. Well, I mean, this shit's still. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> this is fucking amazing. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Isaiah yeah. was freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> the reaction, yeah, it was crazy. There's so much so, going on that it's like I need to see like a slow-mo. You will, yeah. It, I think it I think it maybe is the next clip. Oh, you'll see it so, slowed down. Nobody but, in the gym has any idea what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people are just <laughs> playing horse in the background. Yeah. yeah, he got a lot of of flack from someone that we respected for wow. this because it was nine nine. So now we always say rim heights. We always like you know, disclose it at the time. It wasn't fully discussed. But that shit's like that's powerlifting the when they're like, Sumo. oh, but it was a, it was a <laughs> whippy <laughs> bar and <laughs> you used straps. Like, God. For us, it's like get in the same gym, yeah. try to do the dunk on the same height. Like, that's where I love it. That's why we love dunk camp because dunk camp every year, it's like, look, we're all going to be on the same rims. We're all going to be in the same session. Let's see who shows out. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And, and it's always a fun competition. It's always crazy, like, to see what guys do in that environment. But I personally, he's done that on nine, nine, and three quarters. Nine, ten, and the, three quarters. Wait, which dunk? Which 360 dunk? behind the back between the legs. Yeah, yeah. Nine, nine, and three quarters. Nine, nine, and three quarters. I saw him hit at a dunk camp on the side and finished on the side of the rim. I know for a fact that was nine, ten. So I would say nine, ten personally. But I've seen him do it now a couple times. I, he's going to hit it on 10 feet eventually. That dunk's probably one of the greatest. On 10 feet, probably, what do you think? What would you say on, on 10 feet? If if you look up uh, Dunk Academic's birthday session, that whole session was like crazy new dunks that nobody's done. So that's, mm. yeah. I would say Lost and Found is probably one of the, the greatest what, what, dunks. <laughs> what, uh, what happens when you guys go to, like what happens when you're like around like NBA players or high level players? Like, You'd have to answer that. Do, do they, do they, uh, do they, you know what I mean? Like do they, obviously there's a lot of people that know who you are, but there's a lot of people that don't, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, with NBA players, um, a lot of times they're like judging dunk competitions and stuff like uh, that. Um, but it's honestly just like anywhere you show up, just try your best to show out. If there's a hoop, like we're gonna mm-hmm. we're gonna show up in there. But and you do probably get immediate respect, right? They're probably like, 
Hey, or they or they hate on it. You think it, sometimes like, some hate, some yeah. hate. Yeah, because yeah. they're like, I could do that if I tried. Like, oh, that would be you easy. Don't if have I actually def- gave a shit about it. There's no defense. <laughs> 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 or like some people kind of view it. You know, in golf, they're like, oh, it's like long drive. Like uh, it's the same. And I'm like, it's not really the same. I see your point, but it's yeah. There's more skill to it, and like all of these guys, not all of them, but a lot of them, we can play basketball at a decently high level. I've seen Isaiah play defense against one of the best, or actually 1v1, against yeah. a kid that was going to go, or probably will go to the NBA in a couple of years at OT. And it was like a fair match on 1v1, like 1v1, just mm-hmm. purely the athleticism that he has. And so some of the guys hate on it because it could be a jealousy thing. Some guys, like Steph Curry, like freaked out when one of our athletes, mm-hmm. Brandon, Brandon Ruff, B. Ruff, he did like, I don't even know what it was. It was like a push off double up or something. Yeah, he like went over the hood of a car and dunked it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And then Steph was like, fr- Steph Curry's like freaking out. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, whatever else. So you get, it's a little bit polarizing, at least in my the experience. The guys that are secure and they're already locked in <laughs> yeah. really good, they probably don't care as much. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's what I'd say. Well, how do you actually, uh, I'm curious about this. Your Was your goal with basketball to play in the NBA? Yeah, that was that was always my number one goal. Um, when I was in high school around my senior year, I didn't have any like D1 offers to, mm-hmm. to play basketball. So it was kind of looking like that was going to be a pipe dream. And then that's when I found out about pro dunking. And I was just like, OK, I have talent for this. I have potential for it. Let me focus 100 percent of my energy in it and just see how, how far it can take me and, and go from there. Yeah. And, you know, you guys were mentioning when it comes to to jumping higher, you've mentioned the jump shoes that used to be something in the past, right? There's a lot. I'm still rocking those. (laughs) You know, there's a lot of stuff you see in the jumping community. So I kind of have a a, a two parter here. First off, like you guys are putting out amazing information and content. So people need to pay attention to you. But who else is putting forward some pretty cool information when it comes to jumping that you think people should pay attention to? And then on the other side of that, what kind of concepts in jumping do you think is bullshit? You don't need to say names, but just concepts that you hear talked about that you think that's not very smart when it comes to this whole game. I mean, I guess you could say, who who are you most looking at? Whose content do you like other than ours? We like our content. I know, I know, it's, <laughs> it's great. No, I don't know. Um, as far as who to watch to... To learn. I think Paul's pretty good. Paul for Brits, I think is pretty. Yeah, P- PJF is solid. Um, man, that's a t- that's a tough question. I like any any like strength training like content on YouTube and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. Zach, he was teaching us like the Olympic lifts. That was huge for me in terms of learning how to how to jump higher because strength training is such a big part of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, his content I watched a lot. Um, Shoot, Oof. I got to uh, think about that question some more, man. I mean, I being a coach and, like, kind of looking at, you know, they're kind of obviously competitors, but there yeah. are guys that, like, I have an immense amount of respect for. I think Joel Smith, we were, we mentioned him or her, him, sorry, earlier, uh, and Just Fly Sports, he's he's done great work, you know, mm-hmm. for years. I think he's great. Um, Paul Fabritz is a really, really, really bright guy. He more specializes on the side of basketball, but started actually – you know, in the vertical jump community, I would call it that. Like he was coaching vertical jump first, yeah, and kind of was a really good basketball player. And Stuart McGill is a, another big, big one that I yeah. like. Um, yeah, if we're looking at like everything, like what we take is probably different than other people. Like most kids yeah. are like, "What's the jump? Like, what's the jump stuff?" But uh-huh. like stuff that we love is we love Stuart McGill. We know you guys had him on here, and like we were geeking out about, it. We're like, "Oh, he's, he's the freaking <laughs> shit." Um, so he's really big. I love Ebony Rio for anything on Ten and Health and Jill Cook on Ten and Health. Craig Pearl. Ebony no what? <laughs> Ebony Ebony Rio. E- Ebony Rio. So it's E B O N I E space and then Rio is R I O. Okay. She has just come off like. Her and Jill Cook. Jill Cook is J I L L. Mm-hmm. I know you said your spelling was a little bit slower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and and Cook is just like obviously like you cook. Yeah. Also, um, any any dunkers that are just like show freak displays of strength, uh, like Jay Clark the jumper, one of my favorite athletes to watch train. Uh, T flying high, Myrie Bowden. These are all guys that are just freaky strong. Like I think Jay Clark, he power cleans like three fifty at my my body weight. T flying high squats. What? Yeah, T flying high. He's squatting in the 500s at mm-hmm. my body weight. So it's just guys that just amp me up to go lift some heavy ass weight. You yeah. guys would love T flying high. Yeah. He is he is traditionally a power lifter at I heart. I like the name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, wow. I think it was, what's his actual, do you know his actual Antonio name? Antonio Egan. Antonio Egan, yeah. So 
Antonio Egan. Eaglin. Eaglin. <laughs> Eaglin. 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 Putting Andrew to work today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he um, he just joked about it before. He's like, they say the name so fast, and I just can't keep up. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, well, because Zach was saying like these uh, foreign names, and I'm just like, fuck, dude. There's no way I'm gonna oh, yeah. spell that. Like, Zach. I can't even repeat what he just said two seconds ago. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. So he he is one of the strongest dunkers I think that there is. I think his his powerlifting low bar, you know, sitting back squat. I think what does he do? It's, Five something low bar onto a box. I don't know. Or, you tell me. You decide. Mm, the I've seen him. I've seen him high bar like close to five hundred, like for reps. Some lifters can that's jump like that's crazy. Jay Clark. Oh, that's Jay Clark. Yeah, he's, he's some lifters can jump really well, especially obviously there's Olympic lifters. But uh, yeah, I want to say like Brad Castleberry could jump really well. But I want to say uh, most I've seen him do is like is jumping onto like a box or something. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's like, I, there's it's, also that. Why are you laughing different? about Black Castleberry? <laughs> I'm, just not la- so funny? I'm, I'm just smiling. What's so funny? <laughs> I'm just smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I smile. He, he can't have a fake like vert, dude. Like that's gotta be real. <laughs> that's why he's, I think that's part of the reason I've why he that. did it. I don't know. I don't know much about him. I he's know. always accused <laughs> of like the fake plates and oh, everything. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's funny. Cause like for us, that would be like the rim height talk. It's like, oh, it's a lower It'd be like a couple inches. And like, I, I don't know what the deal, does he use like, is it like 25 instead of 45? Is I don't it like think we even know. No, who knows? You don't know? There is, there is a Sorry, bodybuilder. Sorry, we don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything. I literally don't know anything. I don't know either. <laughs> On TikTok, I saw a bodybuilder who jumped like Mario. Like he like was floaty. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. You're talking about the backflip guy? Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> backflip guy. Yeah. Have you seen that? Forgot his username. He's but like yeah, big I know as talk- hell. But he Dunks can does jump. A yeah. yeah. He's unbelievable. It's crazy. So, I know uh, Brad Rowe, a bodybuilder friend of mine. He could jump like crazy, sprint really well, fucking giant ass legs. Can't, can't Phil, Phil Heath used to love, like, loves oh, basketball. Sure, and he yeah. can dunk like pretty easily, I think. Mark oh, Mark Henry did a dunk contest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We saw that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's, he's awesome. Crazy. Too. What about, um? yeah, in that same video that we were watching, there's like the longest dump, dunk ever. Like a dude, like, uh, I want to say, did a dunk from nearly the three-point line that's your guy what you're talking about james, a, you're not talking about james white right he's the, the dad Weston? the dad of the guy who jumped from the free throw line that shit was oh oh wild. Uh, oh not charles mike, austin conley mike conley mike conley yeah mike conley is done so mike there's there, so oh, there's many a long, there was like a long jumper guy so I mike think. conley yeah. mike conley was one of the farthest i've ever seen james white is also one of the greatest distance like he he did it between the legs from the free throw line our friend jordan westner has done <laughs> From behind the free throw line. He's done one here from behind the free throw line. Uh, another one of our athletes. Well, we used to coach Jordan. Now he's doing his own thing. His name's Jordan Westner. And then another athlete. His name's OB Chamberlain. Ironically, Chamberlain. Mm. But not related to him <laughs> anyway. He's done. I think he's getting close to a windmill from behind the free throw line. What? He's, yeah. He's six, six and has a eight, eight reach, which as is, is eight foot. So he gets another additional eight inches on his reach. And he is a one foot jumper and they can handle way more speed. And so what he's capable of doing if he stays healthy is it's going to be incredible. Is an eight um, foot wingspan uh, pretty big for his height or is so, it kind of? Uh, not wingspan, but reach. So reaching oh, straight oh, up, oh. Isaiah would have eight feet. Uh, wingspan, I think you're six, I think four, six, five, six, five. And I'm six, six, one, six, two. Yeah. So I'm six, my, I'm six foot and my wingspan is a six, two, I think an inch shorter than his. This so yeah, Mike this is Connelly. Mike Connolly dunks behind. And hangs on the rim. Yeah. Oh, I know that was a different one. I think you might show a couple of different ones. Yeah, insane. Yeah, he's he's insane. Crazy. Yep, legitimately from behind. Who's the first guy to dunk from the free throw line? Do oh, we know that? Dr. J, I think. Was it Dr. Mm-hmm. J? I, I don't know. He's the actually. first one to do it on a big display, that's for sure. Yeah. Isaiah is into all the dunk lore. He could answer most of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> I would have a hard time knowing off the top of my head. Um, but I think... Yeah, I mean, James White is probably the best I've think, ever seen. I think they were trying to, like, eliminate the dunk from basketball, weren't they? I think in, like, college basketball. <laughs> yeah, the, in the 70s, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Would just crush everybody so bad. They were like, uh, I think all the little white guys were like, excuse me, can we it's potentially like, change the rules? <laughs> You're not wrong. Probably some truth to that. That seems illegal. <laughs> <laughs> there's probably there's probably some truth to that. Uh, it's like he'll, he'll he'll still swat your shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like you can't take that. What are you gonna take blocking out of the game? Not gonna happen. Well, then he just started to develop that sky hook that yeah, no one could hook. stop either. Didn't yeah. matter what anybody. Isaiah did. went down a rabbit hole recently studying like all of the technicalities each decade of basketball, and that was a big one in what the 70s was just sky hook every time. Yeah, or something he, was, like that. he was like UCLA. Um, 
Yeah, they they had to ban it. I think they banned it for a couple of years. And he, they uh they won a championship like ten or eleven years mm-hmm. in a row or something crazy like that, yeah. right? Yeah, that's that's insane. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. This is great, by the way. Mm. Oh, I'm, you, a, I'm scared to drink the whole thing. Do it. <laughs> you're, you're gonna be uh, fine. Just, you're gonna be fine. I need to try to find something <laughs> for myself. <laughs> but what's that? But what I'll, it just it numbs your tongue and it, just, <laughs> it numbs your tongue, calms <laughs> you down, and it it kind of doesn't. I'm not. It doesn't. I don't know if I can say this. It doesn't taste great at no, first. You should drink it with some water, yeah. but. But yeah, it no, it doesn't taste good. It take, takes a little bit of it. Yeah. You'll, you'll chug, like chug it. You'll the whole thing. It. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah's going to be like, I can't breathe. <laughs> Isaiah, my guy, do half. Do half. <laughs> do half, do brother. Half. <laughs> All right, but but on the other side, is there any BS in, in terms of jumping? Like within, you know, within different types of sports, there's always there's certain mm-hmm. things that people think is going to move the needle, but is found out to be, that's not that oh, useful, man. right? Like so myths? What, You'd say yeah. like just like fact or fiction? Fact or fiction, I guess. Kind of, yeah. Just things that you see perpetuated a lot where you're like, that's not going to help you dunk, you know, <sighs> if that's there's That's really any. tough. I mean, it's funny because I like to look at things from all different lenses. So even when I see something that's complete bullshit, I'm the type that'll be like, well, you know, I mean, maybe there's a little bit of legitimacy for X, Y, and Z. Like, yeah. I can see reason for this and this and this. So if I were to like, you know, remove my, my, I guess, bias or add my bias in mm-hmm. <laughs> and say what I thought, it's tough. I think- I mean, there's so much validity for now what is out there. It's so much better. I would say 10 years ago, there was just so much just shit to sift through to yeah. know what was real and, and what wasn't. I, I really don't consume that much content of that stuff because I just think it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I think there are so many different, there's so many different types of, of training sessions you would do where I could personally break it down and say, I don't like X, Y, and Z for X, Y, and Z reasons, Yeah, you know, it, it, across the board. And it would be hard for me to say, you know, definitively, this is the key. I would say a funny one that is, that is kind of used to be a, jo- or was a joke on TikTok probably a couple months ago was uh-huh. I got my bounce from doing 10,000 calf raises, like body weight calf raises a day. Mm. There's no okay. real validity to that. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of ridiculous. I would say. And, it, it, and it's also possible that it may have helped someone that has like zero oh, athleticism yeah. <laughs> yeah. and didn't do yes. anything previously. Well, right? it, there's also the scenarios where you probably had the freak athlete that yeah. was like going to dunk no matter what. And he was like, I did 10,000 calf <laughs> raises every day and it worked. <laughs> I think the Vertimax had, used to be really, really popular. I don't think it's bad actually. I think that the Vertimax could be used in the right context. It's got actually. bands on it or something. Yeah, right? it's like yeah. the bands on like a. We've never used it because I'd rather do a, you know, a, a barbell jump or I could do a, a variable resistance squat or something. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that that's fine. I wouldn't even say it's bullshit, but I would rather do other things. Um, I think it could work. It's worked for a lot of guys. Mac McClung used it like <laughs> Mac religiously. McClung. Jesus. Mac McClung is. I, we want you him to come to like our him. side. <laughs> I know. I've heard that so many times. I've also heard I look like John Cena. <laughs> Oh, right here. He's, yeah, right here. Just, he's right here. Can you guys see me? Right now? <laughs> we, we get it all the time. Like I would, I would do these voiceovers and people would be like, Hey, did, any, did you see anyone speaking or did you just hear words coming out? Like I didn't see anything in that whole clip. So I used to get that quite a bit. I've heard Tom Brady before cause my hair would be quaffed yeah. appropriately. You have a very <laughs> American yeah. look to you. Like, like basic white guy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, like, yeah, this kind of sucks. <laughs> like, Perfect I've, for dunking though. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I've heard so many. We, we, we used to put it on my story. And I have an identical twin, which is, makes it even funnier. It's like, I have someone that actually is genetically the same that actually looks like me. Yeah. But yeah, I've heard John Cena, Tom Brady. I've heard- Just do a Steve Rogers cosplay. Hey. <laughs> like, honestly. Yeah. Hey, at least these so are all crazy. handsome people. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, thanks, man. I really appreciate right? that. <laughs> so um, I don't even remember what I was saying. So bullshit wise, I I couldn't really pinpoint any. I guess, Isaiah, do you have anywhere you're just like, this is ridiculous. I just think this is like a myth. I guess, what do you, what have you guys heard? Maybe you could say some stuff where we could be like, that's true or not true. There's a the Vertimax. It's not that bad. It's jumping exercise. Yeah. I think that's good. I really like that, honestly. <clears throat> that's cool. So what about just the idea of like, maybe since there's certain athletes that are asked, they're asked to jump so much, like a volleyball player, a Ooh. basketball player, like maybe the training for it is to not jump. Like yeah. maybe the training, maybe like the majority of the training, 70%, 80% of the training Meanwhile, a lot of guys probably think to jump, like I better just keep jumping. I got to jump, 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 jump. But maybe the, one of the best things they could do is like weight train, do lunges, train the whole body, right. get better sleep. Like there's probably other spots they can look at and they can really increase their vertical maybe through a lot of other means. Yeah. I think uh, the most important thing is specificity. Like if you want to get better at something, just do it more. So that helps if someone doesn't have good jump technique, if they have a background in some other sport and they just want to get better in that way. Mm-hmm. That's when I would recommend jumping a lot. 
But for someone that has put in their 10,000 hours and started jumping higher, that's when you want to go into like the more like general prep stuff, like lifting and running and warming up, like all that, all that stuff. So I want to hear what I love this. When you talk about this, what is your lens? I love quizzing Isaiah on stuff because sometimes I'm like, oh, I didn't have that experience. But one of the things that he did that's very different was jumping a lot as a kid. I guess for you, you know, looking at kind of that and dissecting it, how important do you think that is? And at what point do you think it's like, okay, now I need to start lifting because you, you kind of did that, right? Yeah. It's the most important thing that I ever did to jump higher was jump a lot. That's how I got the technique for literally every single approach that I, that I do today. Yeah. Um, but the secondary thing was just getting stronger and learning how to balance the jumping and the lifting so that you can be healthy. Mm. Yeah. Fat Project family, how's it going now? We like to look good in the gym and out of the gym. Uh, that's why you always see Mark and I and Andrew is stepping up on the short, short game, mm -hmm. wearing shorts from Viore and clothes from Viore. And honestly, the number one compliment that I've seen that I've gotten and even Mark's gotten is, damn, your butt looks good. <laughs> and that's because, well, the clothes we wear make our booties look mm -hmm. delicious. Andrew, how can they get it? <laughs> yeah, you guys both have pretty big wagons. Uh, you guys can head over to viori.com slash power project. That's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash power project to receive 20% off the most amazing apparel that looks so good inside and outside. It's going to make your ass look Fat and, and your people ass like will that. look fat. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Uh, <laughs> God damn it. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Make your ass look fat. <laughs> you know, you were, both of you guys were talking about your tendinopathy. Yeah. And then oh, yeah. you inside of the gym, you're talking about isometrics for tendon strength. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really curious about this because I think this can be applied to lifters. This can be applied oh, yeah. to jujitsu athletes. How should athletes be approaching strengthening tendons and actually how should first off how should athletes approach dealing with jumpers knee then so tendons in general how how we approach it uh we basically do like a tendon survey every single day so first thing that i do when i wake up is i choose something that's provocative for the tendon so that can be like a body weight squat a lunge going up and down the stairs and I rate it from one to 10, 10 being like excruciating knee pain, one being uh, no no pain at all. And I'll do like a, a body weight squat. Let's say I'm at a four out of 10 pain. Mm -hmm. A four out of 10 is considered uh, too much. So if I did something the day before, if I went up to anything above a three, I know whatever I did the previous day was too much for my knees. So that next day I'm gonna do something that puts me at a three or or less. So that tendon survey is really important because now you you got something that you can track. And if you can track something, you can change it. And then from there, you just literally just follow, you follow the progression. Um, so when I do a squat and I'm at a three, now I can do isometrics and slow strength and I can start loading that up, getting stronger at it. From there, I'll progress to doing the depth landings and then the max effort jumping. What do some of those isometrics look like? Uh... The best one, I don't know if you guys know what a reverse Nordic is. It's when you're kneeling down on the floor and you kind of lean back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what I do is I kneel in front of something like a couch. Or, you're in like or, a Seiza position, right? Mm -hmm. you're, yeah. Like you you go, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I kneel in front of like a couch and then I put my hands on the couch and it's literally like a, a leg extension into the ground. I'm pressing into the couch and I'm holding that position. And I find how, like John was saying earlier, there's pain positions. So I might be, my pain position might be at 90 degrees. I find that angle where I'm at about a three or less in pain. Mm -hmm. And I'm just pressing into the ground, hold that for 45 seconds. The pain dissipates a little bit. You know, you did it right. If the pain went away and it's kind of, we describe it as like ibuprofen for for the mm. for the knees. I wish we had a visual. Is there anything on like your Instagram, or should I'm we just looking, look up the reverse? Just, I wonder if he could exactly. show Maybe us in front of the table. Yeah, yeah, I have a on my YouTube channel oh. on one of my lifting videos. I do it as my as my warm up. I, remember, I have it on there. I remember how long ago that video was? When that was? Was it a month ago? <sighs> that was like two weeks ago. I, I want to say. Okay, that'll yeah. I hope a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, so that's kind of the guidelines for that. Uh, some more tendon health guidelines, um, isometrics, we do them for 45 seconds. The reason we do that is because after 30 seconds, there's tendon creep, I believe. Yeah. Or, so they're viscoelastic. And so tendons can be stiff really when they're put under load, they can be really, really stiff. And then when they're 
over a long period of time, you can actually get the tendon to soften and, like you said, tendon creep. Oh, and so, so sometimes it might hurt a little bit at first, right? Yeah. And then it will dissipate. It'll dissipate. That's because you have nociceptive nerve fibers or pain signaling, you know, mm-hmm. nerves in there. And they're basically desensitizing. And this is Ebony Rio and Jill Cook, like I was saying, this is their big line of research. And basically what they found is by doing that isometric for 45 seconds, you're able to untrain your pain sensors in that position. So by doing that and holding, yeah, so this is the reverse Nordic Good job, Andrew. Isometric. <laughs> so basically he would hold this like position. Right there. Yep. Right there. You just hold there for 45 seconds. Yeah. yeah. So some people that are listening uh, or some people that are watching rather, if this seems like it's going to be really difficult, all you have to do is hold a band and attach it to something sturdy and you can have some sort of support. A, yeah, you could resist it or assist it. Sorry. You could right. put a towel around a, a whatever you want. Yeah, and whatever just way you got to get up. support. Yep. Yep. And you can also change the, the angle of the knee. So like leg extension, I'm uh, almost parallel with my leg. I'm holding that. I might do a manual ISO where it's like all the way in knee flexion I'm pushing out. So again, you find the pain position. You find right. hold it. I've coined it recently as pain pain position isometrics because if you don't actually dip into a little bit of that painful range of motion, you really won't detrain that nerve. I found that just anecdotally after working with thousands of athletes, I would I would have these really, really difficult cases where guys would come in. There was a, an athlete named Cade Karchner. Cade Karchner could do it between the legs. He's six foot. You know, he's really freaky athlete. And he had worked with us, but was like, oh, I can do this on my own. You know, mm. I, I, I got this and then realized, eh, maybe I don't have this and started working with us again. And so I'm talking to him and I was telling him, you need to be in a my, very moderately tendon aggravating position, little bit, little bit of pain, just tap into it a little bit, hold that for 45 seconds. Over time, that 45 seconds, because of tendon creep, you're able to load the core of the tendon. This is Keith Barr's research, what he studied. I might be misquoting it, but it's almost analogous to if you were to slap water, it would be really, really like, you know, a sharp feeling on your hand. Mm -hmm. If you put your hand into it slowly, you know what I mean? It's not going to, you're not going to have that stiffness. And so over time, basically the tendon, you're able to load the core of it. So that's one of the, one of the benefits to doing the isometric. The other one is that tendons need to hit a certain threshold. But if you were to do really, really heavy back squats, you might exceed what the threshold or capacity of your tendon is, and it'll make it worse. It's like, hey, you know, I can handle this much, but if I decide to exceed that, this is the capacity of my tendon. If I decide to exceed that, you're going to have pain probably in a tendon. It's very, very likely you're going to have pain. And I've seen this, I've tracked pain scores for the last five years on thousands of athletes, and I've very consistently, I've observed it anecdotally. We see it in research. I've seen it with him, with myself. If your pain scores are jumping up the following tendons, Tendons have a latent pain response. So you might not have pain during the activity, but the following day and even up to 48 hours after, your pain might skyrocket. Mm. Like you might you might pull up after a dunk session and be like, let's say you do the dunk session on Monday, right? So it's whatever, you're you're good to go. Next morning, you feel fine. Now on Wednesday, all of a sudden, your knees feel like shit. And you're like, what did I do to make my knees hurt? I did nothing yesterday. Well, it was actually two days prior that really messed you up. And so that's another thing that makes tendons really tricky and why it's really important to track pain not only 24 hours after, not only during the activity, but 48 hours, even as far as 48 hours later, mm-hmm. because you might not know that you fucked up and you went too far until that point. And so then you have to retroactively say, okay, what you did was too much. We need to take a step back and go to a, along that progression that he was kind of delving into, take a step back in that progression and then build you back up or stay at that step for a little bit before we take the next step forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, so with tendons, I found that to be super effective. I, I don't necessarily think that's the case for every knee injury. I, when I've had meniscus injuries, I've had a little bit of a different approach, but with tendons, regardless of whether it was an Achilles or I, like what are common tendon injuries for, for jumpers, for him, it's quad tendinopathy. He has one in his hip that bothers him and then patella tendinopathy and Achilles tendinopathy. Those are the common ones. So basically just all lower leg. For you guys, what are the most common tendon injuries that you guys actually see? We see a lot of elbow. Really? We just see a like lot bench of, press? We see a lot of elbow and shoulder. Elbow and shoulder for bench yeah. press, absolutely. You see that a lot. And then, honestly, for squats and stuff, you'll see some of that, too. Just the patella yeah. tendon will kind of flare up? Um, and you'll also see a lot of meniscus stuff that happens. I know specifically with jiu-jitsu, and I wanted to know about the meniscus stuff after because I wanted to talk a little bit more about the tendon stuff. Um, but in jiu-jitsu, you see a lot of meniscus issues. Really? Yes. Just the twisting and rotating around that. Mm-hmm. that. And we have to talk about what you do for that because I have two. I know two guys that are dealing with meniscus issues right now. But 
going back to the progression of doing tendon work, you're also mentioning that this is something that somebody can attack with frequency. Um, you said maybe potentially three times a day or every six hours, right? Yep. So what does that kind of look like in practice? So I would wake up in the morning. I Let's say that I have knee pain and Isaiah's been in this position before. He you know, did all these dunk sessions, had knee pain, and we call it a flare up. So sometimes you'll have your knee might be totally fine. You've been doing it for six months. And then all of a sudden you jumped one too many times or 10 too many times, or in his case, 30 too many times. And you pull up with a little bit of knee pain. And so we call it a flare up and we're like, okay, how do we deal with this? If he hasn't been doing isometrics three times a day, first thing he does, wakes up three sets, 45 seconds of an isometric. In that case, he could do a single leg. If it, depending on where it is, you want to pick a movement that's going to load that tendon. So his reverse Nordic, the one we showed, that generally loads his hip and his quad tendon. Mm -hmm. And so if he's having issues there, he's gonna pick that isometric. If he's having issues in his patellar tendon, I'm gonna pick maybe a single leg squat where I feel it, I'm gonna go to that pain position, I'm gonna hold it. And so I would do, get my phone, pull it out, I go 45 seconds along that exercise, take 30 seconds rest, okay, do it again. Now I, I might not have as much pain on the second set. Mm -hmm. So now on the second set, I'm like, okay, let me shift my knee forward a little bit, squat down a little further. And find more Ooh, pain. Yeah. Now I found a little more pain and I'm doing it right now. I'm like, okay, now I'm just going to hold this for 45 seconds. Okay, I do that. I take 30 seconds, do my third or whatever, third set. You could go upwards of five sets, probably wouldn't do any more than that. Now, six hours later, let's say you wake up, whatever, it's 6 a.m. when you do that session. Six hours later, now it's lunchtime or whatever else. You're like, okay, I'm going to do my second session of that. You do the exact same thing. Three sets, 45 seconds, a little bit of rest between could go upwards of five if you want. I just, would you mess with adding any load? I know like starting off, maybe not, but over time, would you want to add some load to this tendon work? Yeah, I, Isaiah does this a lot actually when he's on the leg extension machine. He'll do it, he'll add weight, you know, intra, we'll call it intra session, intra isometric session across from the first set to the third or fourth set, he'll go up and wait. Mm -hmm. And then from the next session, if his knee feels better, well, his goal is to get into that pain range. So if he's feeling better, he needs more weight to hit that pain position. Mm. And so, the weight is going to directly correlate in a tendon with the pain because tendons are force transducers. They connect the muscle to the bone and the more force you have on the tendon, the more it hurts. And that's why when you're a jumper, your performance is degrades because the harder you jump, the more pain you feel. And the more mm. pain you feel, the less you want to jump hard. And so what's you guys are chasing pain. We're chasing it. Yeah. We're, we're just, we're kind of on its heels. We don't want to go too far. We don't want to mm -hmm. get to a point where we're bleeding out and dying because that's going to make it worse. But if you're in that range with isometrics of three to four, that's the sweet spot. You stay right there. And if you do it right across the sets by the third, like I said, you could go upwards of five, five sets of 45 seconds. By the, by the third set, it should feel pretty good. By the fourth set, pretty good. Fifth set, you might not even have any pain by the fifth set. And so if you're doing that every six hours, what happens too is collagen, which makes up tendons, can remodel. And so what they've done, Keith Barr basically radio labeled the collagen that you ingest. And he found that hey, when we, we ingest this collagen, we're actually seeing this same radio labeled collagen in the tendon in the tendon tissue, in your knee or your Achilles or wherever else. And in a Petri dish, he found that every six hours was the fastest. They would have these like tendon cells in Petri dishes and they would load them, mechanically load them. And they'd mm -hmm. found like every six hours, we can see activity in the tendon and remodeling and whatever metabolic this is, uh, activities taking This place. is controversial liver, liver king type talk right here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> collagen per collagen. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I, I, I'm not super familiar with that, honestly. Yeah. No, but it's cool. I know Keith Barr is, he's yeah. a big time, like, you know, research, basic researcher on that. And so I anecdotally tried it. I was like, well, let me see if it mm -hmm. holds water in our field, you know, not in a Petri dish. So we tried it and generally found that that was the case. I mean, I, if so I do you guys use collagen as a supplement as well or not really? Oh, it's more so speaking about the isometrics, but in terms of I collagen, um, see, it's interesting because he's making like applied recommendations with what would be pretty basic science. He's mm -hmm. making clinical recommendations based on what's done in a Petri dish. So there's yeah. a lot of steps between a Petri right, dish and a human, yep. but it's one of those things where it's not going to hurt you. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Taking collagen is not going to hurt you. What he typically recommends is, I think it's what, 10 minutes before the session? 15 minutes before? I don't remember the... There's the a time day. frame, he says, I think it's around 30, like 20 minutes before you do your isometric session, you would take in, I think it's 10 to 20 uh, grams of collagen. Um, so what do you say? I'm going to do it. It's, it's a lot of collagen. It's worth a try. <laughs> and if, a little if, bit of vitamin C. That's the okay. other thing he says. Yeah, because it helps absorb the collagen. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and again, I don't know. That's his... You know, there's a lecture you could find on Keith Barr talking at a, a sh some kind of symposium where he goes into 
the details of, of that. It makes sense. You're kind of like almost forcing your body to utilize it because of the stimulus that you're giving it via right. the exercise. Yeah. So it's like you're, you're going to give yourself all of this bioavailability of that substrate. And then you're like, okay, let me just dial into that tendon, stress that tendon, you know, what like we do with our muscles. We yeah, go in and yeah, stress, much. stress yep. the protein and then you fill it in with protein. I heard a really good analogy where it was like, okay, if you're looking at a skyscraper, the number of like construction workers on that skyscraper or how many active tendon cells, tenocytes can repair the tendon, whereas muscles are way more vascular. You have way more, you know, availability and, and you basically can repair muscles far faster, but tech, we actually have found tendons are just slower. You can repair them really frequently and they're, they're good at it, but it's still way slower than what a muscle or something else would be. So ligaments, meniscus, those are different types of connective tissue. Yeah. They can still repair, but it's just a very slow process. Mm -hmm. And ligaments are interesting because they're not force transducers between a muscle and a bone, right? Like they're not connecting a muscle to a bone. It's a, mu a bone to a bone. <clears throat> so how do you stress a ligament? What are you going to do? You're going to pull your ankle mm. out of socket. And so it, that's a little bit of a, you know, a different scenario that I don't know I if wonder, you have a great answer. Real quick though, when it does come to ligaments, I do wonder like using a cable machine, right? And using the force from a cable machine to, to, kind of stretch. to, to stretch and pull and going against that resistance. I wonder if like doing isometrics with that could be something beneficial. You know, honestly, I, I have no idea. With yeah. ligaments, it's it's so difficult to say. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've tried a lot of BFR with it and the traditional stuff, like with his ankle sprain, we, we, we've done a lot. He's sprained his ankle a number of times, I guess. I feel like I'm doing a lot of the talking. I'm not giving him a chance to speak, but <clears throat> what is your experience with, you know, doing, when you do have an ankle sprain with ligaments, um, how do you approach it in terms of frequency and what you're doing? Because actually, I want to also mention, because I don't know if people know, you had your competition and you, on a few days before that, you sprained your ankle. Yeah, yeah. So I had a competition on Monday. Thursday, I had a really bad ankle sprain. Uh, the next day after the ankle sprain, um, I could, couldn't put weight on my foot. Uh, but all I did was, was load it basically. Like I just went on a, a 30 minute walk, did that three times per day. The next day I was able to kind of take it through some like range of motion and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, by, by Monday I was, I was good to go for, for the dunk contest. Um, but I, I never do any kind of like isometrics or strength training for any ligament issues. Um, and it's basically just tendons. Tendons is the only thing I do the, the strength work for. And what yeah. about uh, blood flow restriction? Have you guys found that to be effective in some of the stuff that you do or not really? So it's, it's funny. I actually have a BFR cuff in my bag and I have a band because I, I use it a lot for muscles. Um, but I actually haven't found a ton of efficacy for tendons. I think BFR is amazing. I think the research on it is super robust and we're finding that it's super effective, but it's limited in, in what you're trying to do with it, right? So... First off, if you're doing BFR, you're probably at 30% load. And so what BFR has basically demonstrated is that, hey, if you're an athlete who has a sprained ankle or who has, you know, a non-weight bearing injury, you know, or sorry, a, a, you can't bear weight, you know, the injury is so bad. It's like, okay, well now I, I can't squat because my ankle's messed up. I can do, maybe you do the leg extension or maybe you, for some reason, your, your knee hurts or your elbow hurts or whatever else. And it's like, I want a really potent metabolic stimulus, mm -hmm. right? Well, BFR is going to give you that without loading the joint very heavily. Yeah. And so, you know, I found really good success with muscles doing it. Um, I think it's a really good tool for things like a meniscus injury, things like, uh, you know, I'm not a doctor. This is just my anecdotal experience. I just want to make that clear. And there's a- Which is a helpful, to be honest. Like, let's not discount that anecdotal experience. You yeah. guys are putting this shit to work. Yeah, we're, we're definitely using it pretty frequently. Um, so I've seen it work really well for guys like that. I work with a bobsledder named Josh Williamson and- you know, I, I prescribe it for him once a week because he can't squat heavy more than once a week. Mm. And so if he can't squat heavy more than once a week because his PFP hurts, my goal is, okay, well, we don't know the mechanism fully behind blood flow restriction, but we know it, it works. It does something. It helps with at least hypertrophy. And so with that scenario, it's like, well, I need, you know, bobsled athletes have to be strong <clears throat> as hell. Fast. You guys had Ben on here. So he probably talked about it. You gotta be a freak athlete to push the sled. So Josh yeah. is our brakeman for the U S and he needs to be big. He needs to be strong. He, he can squat 450 ass to grass, like sitting all the way down. I can't have him do that because that's going to fuck his knee up. So how do I get a good stimulus on that without wrecking his knees? BFR. I can put 125 on the bar, have him do a set of 20, 20 reps four times. Mm -hmm. His legs on fire. He feels he's going <clears> to <throat> vomit. You know what I mean? And like, basically the mechanism is that feeling, that sensation of that. I need to vomit is what is fueling all of the, 
whatever hormone changes are happening in that area, localized area or all the stress. And so I use it a lot with him. Um, I don't usually use it with athletes with tendon issues, to be honest. I think it's good for, I think it could be good for ligaments actually. I don't, we don't really know. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, it, it's not going to hurt. He already <laughs> has so much activity, you know, like there's a lot yeah. of things you guys could explore. You could do ultra right. high reps. You could do the BFR and you could, uh, do uh, a lot of eccentrics. That's what, a lot, I mean, I know you're doing them with the depth jumps and stuff like that, yeah, but right. you could hone in on those, uh, but you guys don't have the time for it because you don't have the recovery <laughs> time for it. Like, yeah, right. whereas opposed to somebody that goes to a PT, uh, you can throw everything at it because your advice mm. usually is, Hey, I need you to stop doing <laughs> what you're doing in this case, it's like part of his living and part of what he loves to do. Andrew, what do you got over there, buddy? Uh, I wanted to go back to like the ankle stuff. So ankle mobility, even something like the, um, the, re the reverse Nordic for somebody listening to the show, that's not a dunker, but they might have knee pain. Like, Oh, I want to check that out. But like your, your, the top of your foot is completely flat yeah. against the ground. So, so like for some people that's going to be kind of difficult. Yeah. So my ankle mobility got developed through the lifts that I, that I do. Mm -hmm. Um, the reverse Nordics, right? Like I'm in complete extension mm -hmm. at the ankle, uh, on my back squats, I'm going ass to grass and yeah. you need, you need today. yeah, you need ankle <laughs> mobility for that. Uh, and that just kind of, it keeps that range of motion. I don't have to be like stretching all the time and doing anything crazy like that to, to mm -hmm. maintain that. Yeah. So is there anything extra that you guys do for ankle, like health and mobility and strength? I've definitely given you some circuits. I guess what, what circuits have I given you in the past? Cause I've given you a ton of shit. <laughs> An ankle, <laughs> ankle circuit. Uh, I have this, this stability pad and I just put it on the ground. And I'll just, oh, is that a slack? Is it called slack? Is it that thing, or is it? No, it's like a, it's like the blue pads, the thick blue pads okay. that sometimes people use oh, for hip thrusts. A, okay, yeah, you so could also use a pillow. Crazy. Like you could put a pillow on the ground, mm -hmm. um, and you can just balance balance on one foot like that. Uh, mobility wise, I do like any bent knee ankle stretch. Uh, uh, that is really useful. Um, and then I do my ABCs. Like we do like banded stuff. Like I, I do the ABCs with my foot. Um, so all that stuff oh, you know, can help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's, that's, cool. that's pretty dope. For, yeah. for that like stuff, that. I actually think BFR is awesome because it's so hard to heavily load your foot in pronation or supination, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's so many tiny muscles there. And one of the things I think happens is if you were to put an EMG unit, you know, and look at the activity of the muscle mm -hmm. and you do BFR, well, what we see actually without BFR, you go to failure, you'll see higher activity. And what happens in, when you have higher activity is you're going to recruit all of the muscles around that area. And so mm -hmm. if there is a tiny muscle that you weren't able to load, right? Well, BFR is going to fatigue you way quicker and then you can use a way lighter load where you might not have been able to, he's chugging it, mm -hmm. where you might not have been able to. <laughs> <laughs> like, that shit's pretty good. Go. I don't know why. It's, so, it's so, what is in this? <laughs> um, it's just glycerin. Um, <laughs> Mind bullet. Kratom. <laughs> it's a Kratom product. It's cool. Uh, so yeah, then, uh, you know, he, I think it's a good way to get that fatigue really, really quickly mm -hmm. at a light load where it's not going to be super provocative where his ankle's already kind of messed up. And you're going to get the benefits of loading all of those tiny foot muscles or ankle muscles that you're not necessarily going to get if you just do a calf raise or yeah. if you do standing dorsiflexion. You know, it's hard to load pronation, which is where, you know, your your kind of big toes going down towards the floor or supination where, you know, you're on the outside of your feet. So I think that could be a really good stimulus. Yeah, that is really smart to like, and I'm thinking of people they have, they have bad wrists yeah, I think it could be wrap really good. The wrist, and I never, I never thought about that before. Is that mechanically, that's mechanical loading because you, you got the thing, it's yep. stiff and it's stuck, and you got to move it against the rubber that you wrapped it up in. Yeah, so I think, I think those are all, all good uses. But I, I, I have a hamstring, chronic hamstring thing, and I love, love BFR. I put the cuff all the way up on my hip, pump it up to. You use limb occlusion pressure. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. What's the brand, though, of this BFR mm -hmm. cuff? Because there's a lot out there. There so. are a ton. Um, my friend, uh, Thomas Cordenbeck, who, you know, he's one of the, if you guys want to get someone on the podcast, this guy is brilliant. He's That'd one of the great. smartest people I've ever met. Um, I think his Instagram is like Vidinform or something. I don't know how you mm. exactly say Vidin, it. Vidinform? Vidin, Vidinform? Yeah, V-I-D-E-N-F-O-R-M. -E 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 but he uh, he's brilliant. He coaches the the Danish national team for track, super smart guy. So he has a company called Occlude and they, the cuffs are awesome. Um, unfortunately I, the actual pump I broke, so mm -hmm. I had to buy a, a new one to replace it. But 
I would, if I were to recommend anyone, you I, could use I our penis pump. <laughs> Male enhancement pumps right <laughs> behind him. <laughs> Want to get a bigger dick? That's your pump. But you don't have a problem. <laughs> oh, no, Mark. I did used to have a problem, but I went from four inches to five. Hey! hey. hey. How, how much yeah. do they pay you guys yeah. to say that? <laughs> what? It's been like 200K. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Link in so description. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder how they afford that giant building. <laughs> I came in and now I know where all the money comes from. Yep, it's the penis pump. <laughs> yeah, these guys slinging some drugs or something? <laughs> nope. Like, nope. Slinging dick. <laughs> pumps. <laughs> Incredible. I'm taking uh, it home. I said that earlier. <laughs> but be like, there was a penis pump up there, wasn't there? Yeah, there, there was, was a penis pump. There well, was. Like, yes, I have it now. So Just make sure to wash it. Dual cylinder. Dual cylinder. Did you wash it? <laughs> I didn't Did wash, wash it. it? I, I leave it dirty. <laughs> see, what, <laughs> yeah, see what cylinder's missing. Right? Like, oh, okay. <laughs> but but on, on the tendon thing, guys, real quick, I want to know, is this a habit that you guys... <laughs> I got yeah, you, just Mark. Just jump right over the tendon. <laughs> <laughs> is this a habit that you guys have every day? Like you, I don't know if it's every day, three times a day, yeah. but is it something you intermittently do? You stop, you do your tendon work, you do whatever else you were doing. So one of the the sayings that I say the most is discipline over motivation. Motivation is temporary, but if you have discipline, you're going to show up every single day and you're going to put in the required work. Yeah. So with isometrics, we're doing those every single day diligently. Um, n haven't missed a day since we started working together. Wow. And yeah, like yeah, that. you want to dunk or not, right? Yeah, exactly. You want to keep jumping think, like crazy? Right? I think if you have tendon pain, it's it's a no-brainer. To me, it's like full if you body isometric. <laughs> 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 there was there was a guy named was his name Frank Yang. Frank Yang, yeah. yeah you should look up. I think is it the Asian like yeah. being Frank, Frank Yang. Yang? Do you know yeah, Frank Yang? I know yeah. Frank Yang. Look up seizure hops. It's one of his <laughs> top exercises that you can do on YouTube. It's a full body tense. isometric. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So, <laughs> funny story about this. Briefly. He's the fascia guy. Right? Asked, <laughs> no, he's no, not a fascia. Oh, oh. <laughs> now he's like very. Uh, I think he's like very into meditation now. But yeah. this was like ten years ago, and I say and I reference <laughs> this all the time. This is we put like it in the really, exercises really on accident. I'm not gonna lie. We have a. Do you know hamstring tantrums? Do you know what I'm talking about? Where you use no. the bands and you kick into them? What the fuck is this? Yeah, Frank Gang's an it. OG. I remember this! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Frank Gang's an OG in uh, fitness. He's that's a, uh, Some yeah. people will do that with uh, bands uh, on the rack, I think. Uh, really? Oh, the you mean the tantrums? <laughs> Are you talking about the seizure hops? <laughs> yeah, well, both. Like, I've seen, uh, I've seen people. That's, that's like moving around like a baby. Remember, Andrew? We were talking yeah, about yeah. that. Like, try to oh, move around like your so Andrew has a, a, we, a boy that's uh, one years old. Yeah, that's a that's a way. Look, it says a CNS primer. There you go, CNS warm nice. up. If you guys are looking for a so, PR day, truly, he was doing that to warm up, or is that a joke? I, you oh, Phil Deru does something with the the bands. Remember, he he moves like a maniac. I mean, he's not moving as violently as that guy, but honestly, it's something like that. I have no idea. We, as a joke, like our friend CJ, the guy we showed you earlier, the the dunker. He was our film guy. So he's filming Isaiah, you know, for our online training, we have to get all these videos. And so Isaiah is like supposed to demonstrate hamstring tantrums, which is like a quick on off exercise where the bands across the J hooks, you're laying on your back and your, your legs are going like this kind of yeah. scissoring against the bands. And so Isaiah didn't know what that was. And as a joke, he did that exercise. And so we accidentally put that in the training because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get awesome. to see the video. And so guys are like, we would get texts and be like, Hey, am I actually supposed to do the tantrums that way? And I was like, I was like, yeah, it's a hamstring exercise. He's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So for like a year, we didn't know that guys were doing. <laughs> and we were getting like form videos sent to yeah. us. And then like <laughs> that's when it, that's when it came out. Yeah, we got the form video, and we're like, we're like, like doing it right. The hell are you CHP doing? training. <laughs> <laughs> Please do not do that. We did like hamstring tantrum is the exercise. Oh my uh, god. Yeah, that was that was it was, it was bad. <laughs> we fixed it. I yeah. just want to make that. Hey, but that looks like it probably works pretty good. Yeah. I don't know. It, it is something. wake up your nervous system, but it's I'll too embarrassing what. to do. In the gym? No. What's that thing that we have in the today. gym that <laughs> you put your body on it and you shake? Right? Oh, yeah. What's that oh, thing called? You have the vibration plate? Yeah, it, you have it, that vibration plate. Yeah, we have that. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, exactly. it's not any different. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was onto something. Frank Gain had bounce, by the way. He could jump super high. Did. Really? Yeah, he okay. could dunk. Um, I, don't, what, I don't remember. He was fast, too. Seizure hops. Mm -hmm. That's a really offensive name. So I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> That's what it's labeled as. But oh, what, who? Someone you asked a question. I don't remember. It what. was about the 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 habit of the tendon work you guys do. I think that's oh, just right. a really important thing. Even yeah, myself, do it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even myself, I'm going to start doing some type of tendon work for everything every single day. We don't really this. think that way normally. Yeah, I, th I think I it's, haven't thought that way. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where I I tell my athletes for the rest of your life, this is what you need to be for the rest of your life. Three times a day, you will be doing 
a wall seat isometric <laughs> like, yeah. to, to make sure that you're keeping your tenants healthy. And it's sometimes tougher to do. And this is why I think we, we need something portable to help guys do this a little bit easier where they, they do it correctly. They have something to help them do an isometric because if you're going to do something for the Achilles, and I was doing this earlier because I had some Achilles pain, I had to grab a safety bar, get on, what, what is the, the powerlifting rack that you guys, what is that called? The monolift. monolift yeah. The monolift. I'm on the monolift with a safety bar and I'm loading it and I have a plate on my foot and I'm holding on with 135 balancing <laughs> on one leg. Well, if I'm at home, how can I do that three times a day? I don't have a monolift, a safety bar, you know, or the plates to do that. And so one of the issues we've run into, especially with the Achilles, the knee, we've been pretty creative, but it's hard to load your Achilles that heavily at home. What would you do? You know, you're going to push into a wall that kind of works, but your foot sliding, well, you, we've tried putting our hands above a door frame and then pushing into it. Mm -hmm. Well, you're either going to break the door frame, even if single leg, cause my calves are strong as shit. Or I'm going to, like, my shoulders are going to fatigue. And mm. so that's it. That's an Compacts, issue. maybe? Is that, are those helpful? Like a compex uh, unit? Not or? really, because they don't hit the, the tensions. And then mm. it freaking fries your nervous system. Mm. Uh, we had an athlete who his nervous system got, he used those really often. Mm. Uh, EMS. Is that the pressurized? Uh, the, uh, stimulant, the, the little, stim, yeah, things. Yeah. Stim. So you remember King? Mm -hmm. He used it. He used to be able to dunk. Okay. Then he wanted to, then he was like, you know what? I want to be a power lifter or a bodybuilder. So he starts doing all this power, power lifting and bodybuilding and he uses a stim unit. And within, I think he did it for a year or two, his vertical, he couldn't dunk anymore. His vertical mm. plummeted, dropped so hard. Mm. Super strong guy, was putting up big numbers in the weight room. And he's like, well, I'll just stop doing all that stuff. Then years after, he's seeing this like hangover from mm. what he's like, I, maybe it was the stim unit. And I'm like, dude, I have no idea. I don't know what happened. But that was one of the interesting anecdotes I heard. So- I personally have stayed away from it. I used to use them in high school. I think if you're hurt, like a, again, like an injury, like a sprained ankle, or you don't want the muscle to atrophy and yeah. you can't move, I think it's great. I think there's good research on that. So, mm. but no, I've never really tried it for. I did try it in high school for tendons, and I didn't have any success with it. I don't know. If, have you? Did you use it um, in high school? No, I, I've messed around with, with e stems. Like I put, I put it on my face with my friend once. <laughs> 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 but uh, brilliant. As far as like. <laughs> A minimum, I would say, for getting in a routine with the tendon rehab. Mm -hmm. uh, tendons love load. You never want to have complete rest. Uh, but at minimum, you want to be loading every other day, some kind of loading protocol. Yeah. And you're going to see an uptrend in, in your tendon health that way. Have you guys heard of, uh, there's this uh, lecture that our buddy Graham sent me a few, like I think last year, uh, but Robert Schleip talked about like flexing the calf muscle and isometric, just like flexing certain muscle groups for a certain period of time. And there was some research that said that it actually helped individuals uh, have Achilles recovery and strengthen their Achilles tendon from literally just standing and flexing. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I our, seen that. It's you're talking about just flexing the muscle, right? Like yeah, literally just do a body weight, just like body, body weight calf as raise. hard like body as possible. Weight. No, like, body weight, body weight calf raise. For wait, is that what he did? That or literally just like flexing like that. that muscle. And as you hard flex as it as hard as you can. Oh, like this, just, never mind. Just yeah. a bicep. That's like, huge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he, there, there was yeah, research or to the ground. I think either way would work, right? Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to get you the uh, I'll get you the video so you can see. But they they did some research on it and actually helped with Achilles increasing the strength of the tendon and also recovery from injury to the Achilles tendon. Um, so I, I wonder if you guys have heard much about that or have used that. So it's, I would have to look at what the actual tension in the tendon is during that, because mm -hmm. I, I don't know that's technically co-contraction, right? Like yeah, on both sides. It's not being, yeah, it's so, it's yeah. So you kind of just like squeeze both sides. And so it's, I feel like you'd almost have to do it correctly for it to work, but yes. I, you could hypothetically do it. If you were to get your tibialis anterior to fire on the front of your leg, and then you were plantar flexing against that muscle, You'd have co-contraction and you could load the tendon, you know, isometrically doing that. And so I could see it conceivably working, especially for someone like post-op mm -hmm. where they are can't do shit. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that actually might be a really, really good stimulus. I'll send this to you after the podcast. I think so some people might have a really hard time flexing their calf if it's not loaded just because – But but I think yeah. that that's a good thing because – at first, they might not have that great access to flexing it, but over right. time, they'll probably get better and better at it. That's also kind of, uh, that's like pre-tension too. Or, yeah, that, well, that's similar, right? Yeah. Because like in, during a plow, you mean? Mm -hmm. Like where you, before you hit the ground? Yeah, because that, that, that's, that could be a reason like someone like sprains their ankle. Mm -hmm. uh, is you weren't like pre-tense and your foot might be pronated or supinated. And have you guys ever heard about, are you familiar with like the, with depth drops and pre-tension? Give it to us. Mm -hmm. oh, nope. yeah. 
All right, Mark. <laughs> but slowly, all right, I'll, be gentle. I'll ease, ease you into it. So, <laughs> We're going to get it in the comments of this podcast, yo. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Hopefully, they can take a trip. As long as they drop the comments and hit the like button. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyways, they, um, so what, what this researcher, his name's Comey. I can't remember what his, his first name was, but it's K-O-M-I. He was uh, studying basically... And then obviously Verko Shansky's, uh, you guys named your gym Super Training, which mm-hmm. is awesome. It's his book, Super Training, mm-hmm. super well known. But mm-hmm. yeah, no, I was mind blown too. Books, it's man. a great book, great textbook. Uh, so, anyways, what he basically found is what happens before athletes hit the ground, whether it's running or jumping or anything else, is you will actually see, you can see it visibly, and you can also measure it on an EMF or EMG mm-hmm. that the muscle is firing before they even touch the ground. So, like, if I'm running and my foot's about to strike the ground. Mm-hmm. Right before my foot hits the ground, I would have co-contraction and pretension on both sides of the joint so that when I hit the ground, my leg doesn't mush into oblivion. And so it's a way for you to like anticipate your muscles do it reflexively that you can't really to train yourself, quote unquote, to do it is is difficult. It it happens naturally over time just from jumping or that's what like coordination is. Right. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of guys do movements and they don't realize that this is happening all the time. This is like pretensing. And so it's this you know, before you're coming down, you have all this tension in your leg. And what it does is the muscle we know produces more force concentrically in slow conditions, right? So that's why when you bench press, the bar doesn't fly off your chest upwards. Downwards, you can do a lot eccentrically, but like it doesn't just pop off your chest. And so to combat that in really fast activities, your muscles turn on earlier. And so by turning on earlier and co-contracting, contracting on both sides, Mm -hmm. you know, and your, if your calf, I don't know if you can see this, if my tibialis anterior is like contracting, my tibialis anterior is contracting and the calf is contracting on the other side, I could conceivably get a lot of tension in my calf before I even touch the ground, which means I'm not going to take time to generate tension because I already have. Mm. And so when I'm on the ground, my muscles, intramuscular forces are super freaking high. So for him, you know, we talk about proprioception and the other guys like big in a barefoot training. I think you guys are pretty big in a barefoot training. Proprioception is like, where are my limbs in space? Right. And so Isaiah, when he sprained his ankle, one of the, the theories or hypothesis I have is he was wearing a a Jordan 36, which we love. It's a great shoe for jumping. It's like Mm -hmm. a cloud. It's my favorite shoe. (laughs) But Isaiah was doing a warm-up jump and he landed on the side of his foot. And because that shoe has so much cushioning, you can't feel the ground when your foot touches down. And so there's no pretension because he's doing a not a max effort. That is the 36. Yeah. My favorite shoe. Sick looking shoes. I love them. They're the best. They're in Isaiah's car. (laughs) I'll let you try them on after. (laughs) (laughs) So so I, one of the theories is that without that pretension, you could actually really mess yourself up. That's one of the mechanisms I think guys get shin splints. Like mm. you'll hear guys like, oh, I've never run. I'm going to start running for the first time. And they get shin splints. Well, why do you have shin splints? Well, if you haven't run for 10 years, your coordination's wrecked. Yeah. As soon as your foot goes to hit the ground, you're like, there is no pretension. There's no stability in that joint. And your foot is going to mush down. Your arch is going to flatten against the floor. And your shin is going to get a huge load axially across it. Like that's not great. And so... I think pretension is something really complex and like I don't even fully pretend to understand it, but mm-hmm. I think it's one of the mechanisms for, for which guys can land safely and jump really, really high. I don't We've know if had, you guys have ever talked about that. but <laughs> We <laughs> no. had a, a, a guy on the show named Chris Kodowski a while back, and he mm-hmm. talked a lot about fascia. And, uh, you know, there's still a lot that's unknown. I don't know how true this statement is that he said or where he got it from, but he basically said that if you just like touch the body, like in any spot, that the fascia responds differently even when touched in the same spot with the same exact force. So <laughs> that being said, every time you take a step or any time anything gets touched, uh, the response of the body is like a little different. Like the body is like a live, living, thinking, breathing thing at all times. So when you're floating through the air, your body is aware of that. Even though you can't really feel your feet hitting the ground and stuff like that. Right the body still knows like we're about to probably make contact with the ground again. (laughs) Exactly. And when you're in the air, I've heard that before that you do, you do kind of get tense when you're, when you're running, which is really interesting because you're, I guess you're also kind of trying to relax, especially if you're trying to become proficient at like a sprint or run, you know, if you're really grinding it out and trying to muscle through it, a lot of times that's when you get hurt. Yeah. And I think, I think that happens exactly right. how, How I would describe the sensation of jumping a two foot jump, uh, it's relaxed and you're literally throwing yourself into the ground. So I'm like running, running, running. I, I take my penultimate step, which uh, we might be able to show mm-hmm. a jump and I can, I can just tell you where the penultimate step is at. 
but I throw myself into the ground with the penultimate step and then it's like a mini explosion. Like I just one, two, and then that's where all like the tension comes in and you release it. Tell them about when you went to the Jordan brand <laughs> event and there was a sports scientist. Tell them about the story of what he said. <laughs> they, so I went to, it's called the Jordan flagship store in LA and they had a super cool like sports performance lab there mm -hmm. and they had force plates on the ground and i was able to like test my vertical and hang time and they said that michael jordan had the record for hang time at 0.92 uh i went in there and they had like 3d motion capture uh cameras like analyzing I could, you could see like the force vectors as i was jumping and they tested my hang time at 0.96 which is almost an entire second in the air <laughs> And the guy, the sports scientist that was there was like freaking out. And he was like, he's like, bro, I've never seen something like this. Like, this is like an animal, like literally many explosions are going off um, as you, as you hit the ground. And there's something called uh, RSI, which is reactive strength index. And mm -hmm. he said mine was the highest he's ever seen um, out of anybody. So and he's yeah. probably seen a lot. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as a yeah, sports yeah. scientist. He compared it to Zion Williamson. He said mine was like, cause it's how high you jump over the amount of time that you're in the air for. So a high RSI, you're like, you you hit the ground, you punch it, and you're flying in the in the air. So yeah, it was crazy. Any wow. idea on how much how much the time is that when you go into that transition? It's a I want to say a like third of a second, point is it the, three. Like is the, the flight time or time on the ground? Uh, the transition step that you take, like, and then yeah, how like uh. I guess from the time that you land with that step and then propel yourself upward. I think it's point, that's ground contact. I think it's point three seconds. Yeah. So it's like on a two foot jump, you're hitting, uh, for me personally, I'm hitting left, right. From the time my left heel hits the ground to when yeah, that I, right there, yeah. Yep. Point yeah, three. Point, point three seconds. Uh, sometimes it can get a little faster depending on your approach speed. And if the, someone is at like point four, are they potentially jumping, uh, not jumping as high? Correct. Yeah, there's potential for it. What's interesting about that but is- But it might not make a huge difference. Yeah, because you could, like there's different ways to jump obviously. And what's interesting, like for him, some of his best jumps, are you typically the, the type where the lower the ground contact time you jump higher? Is that generally how yeah, you are? Yeah, So there's, there's other types of athletes mm. where the ground contact time being longer actually helps. I'm actually that way off one foot. There's a like a sweet spot for it. I don't want to be too slow. But traditionally what happens is- how the movement strategy you pick to jump high dictates how long you are on the ground. So if you jump off one foot, that movement strategy, the fact you pick jumping off one foot, you're automatically going to have, you know, between People, 0.25 and 0.18. videos of his dunks? I wanted to mm -hmm. see, like, yeah. what's your one foot You could go to and then uh, there's a, I got you. John Evans underscore THP is my Instagram. And um, there's also differences in one foot jumpers. There's power jumpers and speed jumpers. Yep. So, and it's really common for high jumpers and track to be speed jumpers. Long jumpers and or basketball players, they are usually power jumpers. Yeah. So so what does that mean? Like when you think when you see a power jumper jump versus a speed jumper, what is the big difference? Unless I totally missed it. So there's with two foot, I wouldn't say there is speed and power, other than you could be a guy that's really quick on and off the ground. Like Isaiah's point three. Yeah. There's some two foot jumpers that are point three five or point four. Mm -hmm. I would say you're trending more towards power. I would say if you're a, more of a speed jumper off to like uh Daniel, you know what I'm talking about, the coach. Uh, oh, not this back. video. Go to, go to scroll up, scroll up, scroll up, go to one more up a little higher, a little, that video down right there. That's probably my highest jump. This is interesting. My vertical plummeted because I was training super hard. And then I had like the highest jump I've ever had. So that jump, I was probably on the ground for about 200 milliseconds. Isaiah's on the ground for about 300 to 350 milliseconds yeah. off two foot jumps. And so a speed jumper, what they do is on their drive leg, mm -hmm. they actually flick their foot backwards and it, it's really hard to explain. I would like have to show yeah. you, um, but their ground contact time is even faster. They would yeah. go down to like, what, like 180, yeah. 180 And milliseconds. they're also, they're also going to be planting on the ball of their foot. So yeah. a, a good speed jumper is uh, Nick Briz. If, if you look Nick Briz up, super fast and can take off from the free throw line, especially like on a fast break in basketball games. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. You might have to type in Nick Briz dunk because mm -hmm. we have no idea what's going to come up on his Instagram. <laughs> John, were you uh, mentioning to me in the gym that you were a decathlete? So I actually, I was trying to be a decathlete. That's probably the best way to word it. So in high school, I was slated more or less, like I was saying, to do high jump. So I, I loved high jump. It's my favorite event. I think it's so cool. You obviously saw my hip mobility. You saw how little mm -hmm. internal rotation I have. One of the big things you need to do in high jump is twist. And so what happens, how you get your back to the bar 
is you plant your foot and you twist on the ground so that your back ends up facing the bar and then you flip. Um, and so I have really bad internal rotation. So I wasn't able to hurdle. That's a position you need an internal mm-hmm. rotation. I wasn't able to high jump. Well, I was six, four, but like, or six, six was my PR, but I was never going to be great. Uh, sprinting internal rotation, super important. Your pelvis like rotates around and, and stuff like that, you know? So that's all of the events pretty much, t- uh, shot put more twisting, more internal right. rotation. So lacking that really put me in a disadvantage, even for as powerful as I was in high school. When I was 17, I could half squat 385, like down to a box, down to parallel. I could, which I was 180 at the time. I could power clean 225 wow. and I could bench 230 and I could run a, f- a four. It was like, we use 30 meter dash, but in a, if it was like hand time, mm-hmm. 40 yard dash, I probably would have been like, if it was hand time, probably like mid four fives or something like that. So pretty freaking fast. And then my vertical was 36, 37 inches off one foot. And I could broad jump over 10 feet. So hmm. you look at those numbers and you'd be like, oh, and I could also run the 400 in like under 50 seconds, which is decently oh, fast yeah. and sucks. That is the worst event. Did you ever run the 400? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. But <laughs> I'm, we I'm, should run one after this. It'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> we'll both puke. All of us can do it. Yeah, <laughs> it's really. not fun. It's horrible. So yeah, I was slated more or less out of, out of high school to do the multi, you know, to do the decathlon um, because I was kind of good at all the conglomerate of what I could do. But when I went to college, I wasn't able to do the hurdle the events that I didn't really do in high school that I was trying to do in the decathlon. I wasn't able to do anymore because now to hurdle well, your hip mobility has to be insane. Well, I don't have great hip mobility. Well, you're not good enough to be a high jumper and you're not good enough to be a hurdler alone. But if you can't hurdle well, your score in the decathlon is going to suck. Mm. And so, you know, I would have really struggled with the decathlon or the, you know, heptathlon if I would have done it. But I just had such a drive and desire to be good at it because I knew I had a lot of potential that it just, I ended up getting a lot of injuries, forcing those positions. Forcing Did you hurdles. have, do you recall like if you had pain when you oh, were yeah. a kid, like when you were 17, 18, like doing these lifts and doing in some my of these hips things? and my back and stuff? You just mean, in or? general. Oh yeah. I, I started having knee pain when I was uh, 13 or 14, patellar tendonitis. It was technically tendinopathy, but like the early stages, I started having crippling back pain when I was 14. I started having hip pain when I was 17. I could never deep squat. I could never deep squat. And when I was a kid, we used to go, you know, to like a, a daycare facility, you know, cause my parents were both working and to punish us, they'd be like, all right, knees up, head down. And you'd have to like internally rotate and tuck your head down and your pelvis is rotating and you'd have to tuck into a lot of flexion. I could never do it as a kid. It was the most excruciatingly painful thing that they would force us to do for punishment when we were talking too much, which now looking back kind of seems fucked up <laughs> anyway. So, but we do it all the time. And I remember even as like an eight year old or nine year old, I could never get my knees up to my chest. Like it always hurt my hips really bad and my back really bad. And so I'm fairly confident that it's like a, my twin brother, identical twin brother, same exact issues. So mm, my dad, wow. you know, he, uh, he had the same ish back issues, hip mm. issues, like same exact thing. So my hips have always kind of been shaped that way. And it's always, especially like we were talking and you were like, Oh, well, the, they said my toes have to be this way. And when he said, it's like, or my heels have to stay down by forcing those positions. I royally fucked up my body. Like I had so many issues by forcing positions. Yeah. My body was never built to really do. Um, and yeah, so I positions think, made up by who? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because someone said so who's right, who said right. so, well, I, Mark said so, or Isaiah said so, or John right. said so. So I think forcing those caused a lot of issues. And that was kind of why I never really pursued the decathlon. Um, not at a high level. I trained a lot for it and I loved it and I wanted to coach it, but then dunking fell into place. So mm. that was, yeah, that's pretty much how it, how it went down. What mm. is the key? Like people listening, they want to get stronger for jumping. Like we didn't, haven't really knocked out like a couple <laughs> of, a couple of, uh, you know, let's start, let's start out in the gym and then maybe you can give some other re- reference points, but like, in a given workout and stuff, how many jumps, you know, would you do if you are to be jumping in the gym in consideration of the fact that you're going to be playing basketball as well? Uh, if you want to jump higher, I would first cut down on how much cardio or basketball you're doing. Um, I would say the key number of reps for jumping is as much as possible. (laughs) You want to go in there and you want to, you want to toe the line of basically like almost getting hurt you want to see how much you can push without crossing that that threshold um for someone like me i might be i might get away with 50 jumps in a session 50 to 70 jumps this is like on a quarter in a gym 
Uh, in a gym. In a gym. Yeah, yeah. And maybe or, oh, no, on a basketball court. My okay. bad. Yeah. And maybe somebody like myself might need to divide that down quite a bit since you I might don't be have five. It depends right, like on five what, or what your ten in a day is. or something, yeah. right? And then, of course, you can always like build your capacity up. Right. So when I first started, um, I was jumping maybe for twenty minutes in a in a dunk session. Now I might be going for an hour and a half or two hours. Um, and the two things that you want to change when you're jumping uh, a lot is the frequency of of your jump. So you might start with one session a week, and then you the next week you might do two sessions that week move to three, move to four, and then also the volume of, of jumps. So that's like the how many jumps you're taking each session. Another thing to take into consideration is the intensity. So how if I'm, high you're jumping or how far yeah. you're trying to jump. So if I'm, if I'm dunking on 10 feet, I'm putting every ounce of energy I have into that jump. If I'm on an eight foot rim, I can get away with my 60%, 70% effort, effort jumps. Um, so you kind of want to like juggle all those variables, but the number one rule is just progressive overload, like makes really small incremental jumps every single week. Um, and you're going to be on the, on the right path with that. Also, do you do like, I mean, there's so many things you do now, but are you doing some jumps where you're jumping long and then are doing some jumps where you're jumping high? Yes. What's what's that look like? Kind of, uh, I do some distance dunks. Um, but for the most part, I'm just jumping as, as high as possible. Yeah. Uh, but you, there's different ways you can build variety into it. Like you can go one foot, right leg, left leg, right, left, left, right. That's like the order of the feet that, that you're planting mm -hmm. in. Um, that's a way to add variety into it. Also, if you're low rimming, you can practice 360 reverse dunks. Uh, <laughs> sounds yeah, dirty. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's lots of ways with, to add variety in that regard. And also, I mean, I know there's so much variety, but uh, thinking about like approaching versus just doing it straight off, do you, yeah. are most of your jumps with an approach? Yeah, almost like 99% of, of my jumps would be a full speed approach jumps. And do you think that's doing approach jumps is a better way to build your jump capacity or do you want to have some where you're just standing it's, and then some where you're approaching? It's mainly going to build your coordination um, it's going to make you more efficient um, as far as like, well, sorry, can you re repeat the just question? Like, just like jumping from a still position versus jumping with an approach. Like, do you mix that up mm. or are you, are you, when you're on the court, are you mainly training jumping with an approach? Um, it's almost always with an approach. It's just more like sports specific and yeah. you're just going to get more out of your, your vertical. Will you do a, uh, like a lifting session the same day you're going to have a dunk session or do you keep those separated? I, it depends if I'm doing load management or not. Um, if I'm in load management, I'm trying to manage my knee pain, plyo volume, all that stuff. Um, I'll usually jump twice a week and I'll lift twice a week. So a typical load management setup would be Monday jump, Tuesday lift, Wednesday active rest, Thursday jump, Friday uh, lift, active rest, Saturday, Sunday. If I'm healthy, I'm lifting three times a week, jumping once a week. Um, and then it's rare that an athlete can handle both on the on the same day. Wait up, lift usually when you're healthy, lifting three times a week and jumping only once a week. Yeah, correct. Wow. Well, so you're not on the court every day. Uh no. No, not at all. How, mm. Is that fun for you? No, I I hate John sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm wondering cuz like yeah, not. I literally I want to just dunk every single day. Mm -hmm. So so this is one thing I wonder because you mentioned that when you were younger that you would you just went to the court. You were jumping every single mm -hmm. day, but obviously to get to the level you are now, you needed to do that. So would the beginning phase be get frequency? And then as you get better, you need to decrease that. If frequency? you're, if you're an athlete that hasn't built those motor patterns yet, you want to be jumping as much as possible. I see it a lot with like power lifters um, or lifters in general. Mm -hmm. They'll see us, they want to jump higher and they're strong as shit, but they've never done a full approach jump <laughs> in their life so someone yes. like someone like you like you would back off the weights a lot and then mm -hmm. just build that coordination of, of jumping yeah there's definitely a, like a sacrifice to it too most guys don't want to do that you know if you're if you're someone that loves the gym and you love lifting mm -hmm. if i you know like he loves dunking if i tell him mm -hmm. hey you can't dunk you have to lift vice versa if i tell you hey you can't lift you have to dunk yeah, that's what's going to ultimately make you successful. Yeah. But that might not necessarily be what you want to do. And mm -hmm. so kind of finding that balance is is a little bit difficult. I've seen guys succeed despite that, that love the gym and they'll just go really hard. But 
I've also seen it blow people up and they get hurt because jumping is so high intensity and the intensity you're lifting at really hard to pair those things at the same time. I know? think what would be cool, but also maybe too devastating <laughs> would be a hundred pound jump. So you got a 60 pound weight vest and a 40 pound med ball. And you got to dunk the 40 pound med ball. You think you'd be able to do that? <laughs> That's a heavy ass med ball. Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking hard. Well, so I'm thinking, so I'm Mm. thinking a 40 pound med ball because then you can offload it. Right. So there's less, less landing throw it. Or you can go with a 20 pound med ball, but then you got to land with 80 pounds on your, you know? So if I was basically, if I was a hundred pounds heavier, would I still be able to dunk? I think I could, I could pull some stuff off. You think there would be any value to having like, that's a ridiculous amount of weight. Do you think there would be any value to having (laughs) it would be uh, a lot, (laughs) a six pound vest or four pound, five pound vest. uh, Just, uh, I think it would affect technique too much. He's getting anxiety. Four pound, four pound pound vest. He's like four divided by. No, I'm thinking, I'm thinking thinking four Four pound vest. (laughs) I want, I want the four pound vest, 96 pound ball. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I was joking about that. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't actually do that. But with the, so your question is, would, was just there any value sort of six or four pound vest to do? Just, yeah, just some sort of weight. Uh, I mean, uh, I kind of want to hear, what, I want to hear what your lens is on this, actually. <laughs> what do you think? Do you have you been, have you been heavier or lighter? But uh, right body now, weight. right now I'm the heaviest I've ever been, basically. Uh, Does it help if you're leaner or something or not really? Yeah. Yeah, you want to be as lean as possible if you want to jump high. Uh, Sport-specific muscle mass is what helps me the most. So if I put on mass on my quads, on my butt, my hamstring, my calves, that's always made me jump higher. The times I've jumped the lowest was when I was like, had really painful knees. Mm -hmm. And I was also my heaviest. I was 178 with knee pain. I wasn't lean. Now I'm like 185. Four, um, and I, I'm a lot more lean than I used to be, uh, but yeah, definitely like just sp- specific muscle mass helps. Mm. Yeah, I think it, you we might be able to to use a weight vest, but like the risk of it is almost not worth the reward. I mean, six pounds, four pounds doesn't really make a difference. It doesn't. Well, it may not seem like it makes mm-hmm. a difference, but when you're jumping 45 inches and running as fast as you are. Uh, six pounds is so light, it probably wouldn't matter. Honestly, it would about, be interesting. What about maybe something like uh, wearing a light weighted vest, uh, jumping up onto a box or something yeah, like that? I know? think you could probably do it in a context where trying to be there's safe. low risk. Yeah, yeah, it's more so the, on his tendons because he's not probably not going to jump as high, and so he's not going to land from as high as a height. So there's that. I don't. I think you could probably get away with upwards of 15 pounds. I think after 15, it might be it might get a little risky. Too risky. Yeah. So, so lifting wise, what are some things that have been really beneficial when you were just talking about straight lifting? We see this guy here. Jump, is that you? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, jumping with the uh, trap bar deadlift. And what are some other exercises that have been really, where you guys have been like, this This definitely is really helpful for us? Man, there's tons. What are hmm. your, what? Uh, let me ask you, what are your favorite? Yeah, go to. What are your favorite lifts that you do that you think have helped you the most? Uh, number one is back squatting. Uh, hmm. Half squat or deep squat? Uh, full squat, like deep, like ass, ass to grass squat. Um, that would be, yeah, there, there's 365. That's helped me a lot. Um, I would say deadlifts. Deadlifts have helped me a shit ton. Um, jumping, of course, has helped me a lot. <laughs> that is the exercise. Oh, <laughs> uh, something that I added training with John that I didn't really do a lot before in the past was calf raises. Um, especially just really fucking heavy calf raises. Um, I used to go in the gym and you hear about doing like all the compound lifts just mm-hmm. for like regular strength training. But, uh, yeah, calf raises, people don't, don't really do them that much, especially They're with like devastating. Proper, <laughs> they make you so sore sometimes. Yeah. 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 I um, and I, I love seated calf raises specifically. Um, that helped me so much with my knee pain. Uh, really? Yeah, because yeah, it built up that soleus, right? Yep. The outside muscle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They they hit the soleus, and when you're jumping, the soleus is taking so much uh, energy, mm-hmm. like or absorbing so much energy, and it can kind of take some stress off of 
off of the knees. Power Project family, I hope you guys are enjoying this episode. Now, Mark, Andrew, and myself have been cold plunging for a while now. We actually use the Cold Plunge XL. But the reason why this has become part of our daily routine every single day is because of honestly how good it makes us feel coming out of that water. Now, if you want to take a cold shower, that is beneficial and you need to be doing that if you don't have a cold plunge. But if you do get a cold plunge that goes all the way down to 39 degrees, it's crazy because Andrew Huberman actually talked about the benefits of dopamine post cold plunging. Now, cocaine gives you a 2.5 rise in your dopamine release. Cold plunging gives you that also, but it also gives you a sustained higher level of dopamine throughout your day. That's just one of the benefits, as there are many. So if you guys want to get on it, Andrew, how can they? Oh, yes. You guys got to head over to thecoldplunge.com and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save $150 off. And before we drop off here, I do have to say that this has been the absolute best thing I have ever done for my mental health. Every single day I get in this cold plunge and I come out a happier, more positive, and more vibrant human. I can't recommend this enough. Again, thecoldplunge.com, promo code Power Project to save $150 off. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Let me ask you this. When, uh, you know, because we've had like, for example, Gota, right? And I don't bring them up in a negative way. It's just there's things that are mentioned where they believe like there's compressive forces with the back squat that may compress the ankles and the spine. And I'm wondering... What have you found that after you back squat, do you feel compressed at all? Do you feel like, because what I'm going to is you mentioned that you were doing a hard training cycle, yeah. right? And you'd had like, I don't know if it was right after that training cycle, your, you know, your jump or your vert went down and then it took you a while to like out of that for your vert to go back up, but you made improvements. Yes. So I'm wondering when it comes to lifting and the athleticism of jumping, are there times where you need to back off the lifting so you can actually jump yeah. higher that it like lifting negatively affects your ability to jump in the moment, but it pays off later on? Absolutely. This like, is my favorite thing. Uh, a thousand percent. Mm -hmm. So with him, we regularly build in deloads, which you guys are very familiar with, mm -hmm. right? Your deload week. A lot of guys do their macro cycle where it's, you know, four micro cycle or yeah, four micro cycles, fourth, fourth micro cycles of deload. You know, you progressively build up in volume or intensity or whatever you're overloading. And then you see that's where your best, best lifts come or you'll do a 14-day taper or whatever else and you see big numbers. So it's interesting because we have those general guidelines, but just over coaching him so diligently and using him as a little science project and then all the other athletes we've coached, you know, as well, I was able to really dive into how his body cyclically functions along those, those you know, stimuli. Yes. And so what I found is, okay, he does – this week of loading, right? Vertical might be totally fine. And we lift Monday, Wednesday, Friday, heavy as hell, starts with a power clean, does some squats, does some RDLs, do some calf raises. Maybe there's five, five-ish sets for each of those. Mm -hmm. Wednesday, you come in, you know, similar type of session, maybe some variety. Friday comes in, similar type of session, maybe some variety. Saturday is his jump day. Yeah, you didn't really see a bunch of a decrement, right? Second week comes in, now his vertical is starting to climb down a little bit. Now that's where I'm like, okay, now we're doing what I want to do. I want to see that vertical start dropping down a little bit because that means we are stressing those specific systems to a point where he's seeing a decrement in his vertical. Why is he seeing a decrement in his vertical? Because I've just blasted his quads. I've blasted his calves. I've blasted his hamstrings and glutes. Like I want to see that drop. And then third week, it's like, okay, let's do it. Let's increase intensity a little bit more, drop volume down a little bit more. Let's try to, you know, rev up the nervous system. Let's redline the nervous system on this stuff. Mm -hmm. And obviously making sure he stays healthy. Okay, now we see that vertical climb down a little bit more. You get to that fourth week. For him, he only needs, because he's so well-trained and his work capacity is so high, yeah. he, he's just capable of chewing up weight room volume unlike any athlete I've probably ever coached. For him, it's like you back off, you know, 50% in volume and keep my intensity higher, 60% in volume. By that third, fourth day, I'm going to go from maybe my peak was 50 inches when I was fresh or whatever else. Yeah. You know, and then through the cycle, maybe my 48 and then 47, 46 and a half. Now, by the third day, you see this sharp increase in his performance and you start seeing it like he always says, he's like, man, I could hit that dunk on a deload week. Like I know by that Saturday session, I'm going to be jumping my highs. And it's true. He does such a good job of handling those recovery periods and seeing a big super compensation curve, which people sometimes shit on. They're like, well, it's outdated or whatever, fatigue fitness model. But I will I will stand behind that and those periods of overreaching, you know what I mean? And then deloading or backing off a few days completely, his vertical will just shoot up. And for me, you know, like it's a little bit different as a one-foot jumper. As a one-foot jumper, 
you're way more sensitive to fatigue. I don't know if there's something synonymous in, in powerlifting maybe where like the deadlift is a little bit more fatiguing because there's more overall weight on the bar versus barbell back squat. But mm. I would think your central nervous system is more wired holding a thousand pounds as if that's your max deadlift. What is it? What's your max deadlift? A 771. 771. What's your best back squat? 1,080. Holy shit. So maybe the back squat in your case, yeah. <laughs> you might see more of a hangover, you yeah. know what I mean, after that. And well, so deadlifts were always taxing. I think um, there's there's some uh, research and information about the grip. Yeah. Like when your grip gets really fucked up, your body gets really fatigued. I remember after some hard deadlift sessions um, coming into the gym two, three days later and just like not being able to grab anything very well. And the 45 pound plates felt really heavy. Mm -hmm. And then I, I would sure enough, you know, just not have a great workout because the didn't seem like there was enough zip or energy there. Yeah. So I had to strategically, it wasn't really just the deadlift, but the deadlift could kind of almost kind of paralyze your grip a little bit when you're prepping for it and trying to lift heavier. Right. Maybe that's why for, for me personally, deadlifts were not fatiguing at all. I could deadlift mm -hmm. three times a week without a problem because I'd be hook gripping mm -hmm. and with hook grip, the bar's just yeah. hanging in your hands. That's a huge difference. Yeah. If you, especially if you start to lose your grip at all, you'll start to pitch forward and stuff. Uh -huh. My form and technique was not amazing either. And when you're, when your technique is off, well then we have to account for that too. Like right. if you kind of have a little bit of reckless lifting, which my other two lifts were pretty good. My my deadlift was like off. And so the deadlift, I there were times where I paid more attention to it and really tried to be a stickler, it, but it took so much attention away from the other two lifts. It didn't make any sense for me to pour any more time into the form. So after a while, I was just like, you know what? Fuck, I'm just going to bend down and pick it up. I'm just not that amazing <laughs> That's, why, that's this, what he did today gonna... in power clean. He was just like, all right, grip and rip. Let's go. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. what you did too. Eventually probably at 300. Yeah. yeah. It just kind of got to up. that point. So I'd only deadlift like once a month a lot of times. Right. So I think for what we do, it's everyone's a little bit different depending on their training history, right? If I, if I've been jumping my whole life as a one foot jumper, as a one foot jumper, there it is like, wait, baby. Oh, wait. Wow. Is that the, that's the that's PR crazy. one right there? Uh, I think that's like, I think on that day I did like 715 or something. 705. Yeah. 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 So with that, I would, I would assume like, you know, under a really heavy training cycle, here's, here's a really good question for you guys. I'm curious on a really, really heavy training cycle. Let's say you did eight eight weeks of progressive loading. I don't know what, maybe you only do four, maybe you do six. Which lift would take the biggest hit if they were all relatively similar volumes and, and, and intensity, which lift would take the biggest hit for each of you guys? For me, the bench. The bench press would? <laughs> for me, the bench. Yeah. Like percentage wise, that would be yeah, the highest. Yeah. And then what about you? If we were doing all the same. Like relatively similar volumes right. where it's not like, well, I benched more. Of course, and my bench is going to go down the most. Yeah. Or maybe you have a heavy cycle for each one. Which one would take the heaviest? like three different cycles. One was deadlift focus, one was squat focus, one was bench focus. Which of those would see the biggest percentage decrement mm -hmm. by being fatigued under similar volumes for each cycle? Yeah, it's hard to say. I, th I think it would probably be the deadlift. I think it's like, it's the mental side of it. That's the, like the fuckery of the whole thing. Because even though, if, even if you try to go percentage based, it still doesn't work out the right way because there's, like there's something off that is hard to put into words that is overtaxing your body and you still need lighter weight mm -hmm. on some of these movements. So I would argue like he probably needed a little bit lighter weight on the bench press to make progress. I definitely needed lighter weight on the deadlift for me to make progress. Like if you had pushed higher intensities that whole cycle, you would have just fucked yourself up more or less, you think? Yes, because I, I needed to really hone in the technique more so than anything in the form. And I had to kind of, it would have been really beneficial and it was beneficial. I've done, done this many times and that's when I got the strongest, you know, four sets, three to four sets, four to six reps. I would just have to live right there. But it's like, right. who the fuck wants to do that? That shit's really hard. Yeah. That's what I make him do. And he, I, today I was like, you got to do back squats. It's five by four or five by six. And he was like, I did three. I'm like, no, that's not what we called for, but okay. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> like, so, but yeah, I, I, I heard, heard him saying. say that in the gym too. Yeah, I think you yeah. asked him and he's like, I'm doing three. And I was <laughs> and like, you're like, okay. All right, I guess we're doing three. <laughs> Triples, baby. <laughs> yeah. So with one foot, like you'll, it's so much more sensitive because you're on the ground shorter. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost, it's analogous to like the hundred meter dash, like yeah. the hundred meter dash, your foot is on the ground for I think 90 milliseconds at upright sprinting and one foot jumping, you're on the ground for best case scenario, 180 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So two foot jumping, you're on the ground for 300 milliseconds. The shorter you are on the ground, the less time there is for errors or the, like you could, or the less uh, leeway there is, right? Because it's just, you have so little time on the ground 
that any air, like you just don't have any room that makes for, sense. for Make, something getting mm, fucked up. Jogging, you know, is way safer than sprinting. Yeah. Um, for a lot of reasons, well, but that could be one of them. Yeah. And just the, well, just more so in the performance side of things, like to produce a lot of force in 80 milliseconds is like, you just have no time to produce force. So mm -hmm. it's so sensitive to fatigue where if I blow someone up in the weight room, it's almost for certain that the first thing to go, if they're a sprinter is going to be their upright sprinting. And if it's a one foot, if it, if it's a, you know, me, myself, my vertical is going to plummet as a one foot jumper more than my two foot vertical. I can do both, but my one foot's going to take a way bigger hit just because it's so sensitive to weight room volume. Mm. And I will still push, but like you said, there comes a point where weightlifting will, will murder my vertical. And as yeah. soon as I back off, it's like every three or four days I see an inch or two of my vertical come up and it's like, okay, I touched 10, seven, three, four days later. Now I'm touching 10, nine, three, four days later of easy lifting. You know what I mean? Just really what I basically did today, which was really easy lift, easy quarter squats, some calf raises, cut it there. Like all at around like probably 50 to 60% of what I'm capable of still lifting, but it's such low volumes, slow lifting to just keep my tendons feeling good. And then it's like, okay, three days later, you know, doing that again, boom, my vertical goes up again, goes up again, goes up again. That video that he pulled up earlier where I'm like barely doing a one-hander and then the other one where my head's at the rim, they're both 10-foot rims, right? Mm -hmm. I was warmed up in both of those videos. They're both on that same cycle. I just had more time to let that fatigue dissipate mm -hmm. and really let that fitness shine through that I developed over the last 90 you know, plus days. We'll have mm -hmm. guys jump off our program and then all of a sudden, <laughs> they'll be like, hey, they're like, it's not really working for me or whatever else. They jump off the training. They stop doing anything other than just playing and their vertical will skyrocket. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, because you're not paying me to not train you. You're not yeah. paying me to tell you to not lift, but in reality, there's times where that you need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and we do build it in, but you know, if they're not, there's different tiers. So if guys aren't regularly communicating with me, regularly communicating with me, I don't know exactly how much time they might need off. With him, it's easy. Like his body's so dialed in, we both kind of have an idea of how he's going to do. It's very predictable. Um, for me, it's honestly been less predictable because I don't usually take 45 days of not lifting heavy. You know, like, can you imagine if I was like, Hey guys, I know you want to get better at powerlifting in your prime, but I was like, Hey, don't, uh, don't lift for 45 days. <laughs> like you'd be like, yeah, that's probably not going to fly. And obviously my goal is jumping, but lifting does help. Um, so yeah, one foot is very different than, than two foot. Is there a lot of differences in the training specifically? Like as it pertains to like, I'm thinking if somebody's jumping off of one leg, the other hip flexor is not getting trained the same way. The glute on the other side is not getting the train the same way. Right. Or is that just like, or am I getting into a case of like just really overthinking? But if you jump off your, uh, I guess off your right leg all the time, uh, then your left hip flexor is getting a lot of work. Your right glute is getting a lot of work, but the reverse isn't happening. Right. I, I do think in, this is a fun one. This is a unilateral exercise for single leg eccentrics where, it was 280 on a single leg and it's just lower it down as slow as basically as slow as possible. I think I've done that upwards of 360 on a single leg, kind of mm. like an eighth squat. So I do, I do unilateral work for that reason. And I like to put it in usually for guys once a week, like Isaiah will usually have one day where he's going to be doing reverse lunges or a split squat, or he's going to do a side squat or depending on what he's, what the, what the time of the year is. So yeah, there's definitely an inherent asymmetry, uh, in my, my legs, he has a pretty big asymmetry as well. I guess for me, I would notice my left leg actually is more fatigued often. So I actually suck at lifting often on my left leg, but it's because I jump off my left leg and use it a lot more often. My right leg tends to be quite a bit stronger, even though that's not my left leg. Mm -hmm. And it's not because my left leg's not strong. It's because my right leg is not jumping repetitively over and over. And I'm not getting yeah. all that load through it. So this is weird stuff. Charles Pollock, when used to talk about it, how the uh, the one, one side can respond a little bit better. Like the side that you think is actually weak, yeah, uh, can. Res can respond better to training. Yeah. I've seen that as well. I mean, for you, what are, what are the biggest asymmetries you would say that you have? Yeah. For, for me, my left leg is way stronger, way bigger. And then my right leg, uh, is smaller and weaker. And that's because I'm a left, right jumper. Uh, the right leg is more inherently like, like plyometric. In, yeah in, it's just more elastic it's like yeah. stiffer when it yeah. kind of bounce off the ground with it it's like on it's like on the velocity side of the force velocity curve and then the left leg that's like the first leg that's planting and that's taking all the force like in the jump and generating all the force and when you do that every day for hundreds of reps like your left leg's gonna get way way <laughs> yeah. stronger um yeah so if you watch you, oh. you'll see the block foot 
is this is the very yeah. last contact. That's the elastic one. It's mm-hmm. on the ground a little bit shorter. Uh, that's the the first leg that hits his left leg. That's Jeez. his plant foot. Also, you you mentioned Connor Barth. Have you ever seen Connor Barth's quad? Or one? No, Zach mentioned. Do you know Connor Barth? Do you know I don't. Those? We should pull him up. Oh, I guess. so he uh, Zach mentioned him actually. Mm. But his quads are very visibly different sizes because of the asymmetric nature of jumping. Mm. But just because of like he was saying, one leg is so force dominant. Mm-hmm. The other so like speed, low force, high velocity dominant. It's still high yeah. force, but it's like of shorter time period mm-hmm. that his left leg is like, is it his left leg? I think uh, his right leg is stronger. Oh yeah. His right. So he's a right left plant. So his right leg is just like his quads mm. huge. His whole thigh yeah. is huge. And then his left leg is like way smaller. Do you think there would be any benefit yeah, is Connor. in jump, like doing some jumps with the opposite legs? Would there, or would that take away from the nature of what you do? It's you wouldn't jump as high because of specificity. Of course, um, yeah. You, it's more general to kind of jump with both plants. So it's might as well just like max out all your jumps and all the reps you can do with one plant. Okay. Okay. Makes it almost too, too confusing. Yeah. As a, as an athlete, I mean, as a basketball player, there's, there's benefits to being able to go off all the plants. I mean, if you watch like Russell Westbrook is probably Mm -hmm. the best you would agree. I mean, he can do it all. He can go, you know, typically how you do the plant, like we said, is one leg plants and then the other plants. He can go right, left. He can go left, right. He can jump off his left leg. He can jump off his right leg. And what that does is it allows him to approach the ball, uh, sorry, the basket from so many different angles because you inherently have a preference on the angle that you curve Mm -hmm. when you plant with your right foot and then your left foot. You like to lean in to the right. When you do the left, right, you like to lean into the left. Well, if I'm trying to lean into the left and plant right, left, it's going to feel very awkward. It's kind of against the direction that you're moving. And so same thing applies with your left leg or right leg. Uh, like I like to lean, you know, inwards, kind of like high jump and, and curve that direction when I jump off my left leg to curve the other way is very awkward. It's very awkward for me to jump that direction. It just doesn't feel natural. And so jumping off the right leg gives you that advantage. So by doing all those plants, your game as a basketball player, if you want to be someone that dunks on people opens up a lot. And most NBA guys could do that. But honestly, like you were saying, is there a benefit to doing it? They don't practice it. So it's like yeah. you got to practice it to get better at it, but and there's definitely a, benefits. To and do as it. a dunker, it's not something you guys think would be necessary to um, to improve your ability over time. You don't think you'd need to do that. Um, Maybe just it depends. More like, fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it depends in in what context. Uh, I think to max out the vertical, uh, mm-hmm. one plant is most important. Yeah. Uh, for developing coordination, um, my dad actually he used to tell me uh, this when I was practicing basketball. He said. Everything you learn on the court, learn learn how to do it with your left hand first, and that's gonna like improve your right hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that always like stuck with me and helped with with coordination. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just depends on on the context. Mm-hmm. I have a kind of a dumb question. Do you guys have big hands? Is it easy for you? Like, can anyone mm-hmm. palm? This is not about, a dumb question. Like, we ask this all the time. Yeah. So Isaiah, you can do. I don't know if you guys can see this for the viewers. Isaiah probably has. I don't know, maybe half an inch at each of his fingers of, of length. And yeah. so that does help. I mean, you would know better than I would, but. Yeah. Cause I was trying to fuck around with like, and I was like, I can't palm this. Like, do yeah. I have to be able to palm it? <laughs> so, so yeah, go ahead. Uh, about Jordan. Palming is actually a, a skill. Um, ah. If you look up Jordan Kilgannon's TikTok, we were at dunk camp and we had a, <laughs> what was the name that we called it? <laughs> I don't know. It was something absurd. Probably. Yeah. You're but, already going to get flamed in the comments. You yeah, might as well just go all the way with it. We, we called it like <laughs> palm off or something like that. And we would grab a basketball. <laughs> yeah. And so like, imagine a basketball here. It'd be and, like this. And then you just try to like pull away. And then whoever has stronger hands can pull the basketball away. Yeah. yeah. Jordan Kilgannon had the smallest hands at the camp out of all the dunkers and basketball players. And he just shit on everybody. Like, are his no, hands smaller than both of yours? Yeah. yeah. My, okay. my hands are like, Okay, so I should be able to palm the basketball. You, you should, yeah. based on the, yeah, yeah. the yeah, how yeah. big yeah. hands are. You should be okay. Able to that do. gives me hope. So <laughs> yeah. it's also it's also different too, because like most times we're not we're not palming the ball and swinging it. Like our hands not over top of the ball. Yeah. and swinging it. Like that's really hard to do, regardless of how big your hands are. You have to have dinner plate hands. But oh, this is it. Yeah, this is it. Jordan. So, Jordan would like mess people up at this. Um, he just literally can rip it out of his hand. And Travis, the other kid, Travis, we coach him. Yeah, Travis has. His hands are giant. He could palm the hell out of a ball. But Jordan's hands were smaller, but mm. his grip is just so 
incredible with that ball. He could just pull it out of his hands. <laughs> That's so interesting yeah. that it's a skill. Mm-hmm. Yep. You literally yeah. just like sit there all day as much as you want, just palm, palm a basketball. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and eventually so. your grip's going to get crazy. But wow. there's also a, like knowing how to, and Isaiah taught me this, like moving your hand around the ball is really important in doing trick dunks or finishing mm-hmm. dunks. Like, mm-hmm. so if I'm going to, if I'm going to jump, right. And I want to swing the ball in my arms, I'm going to keep my hands under the ball. If I kept my hand on top of the ball and swung upwards, the ball is obviously going to fall out no matter yeah. who you are. Yeah. And so whether it's a windmill or something else, you always want to keep the ball like opposing the direction of the inertia of the ball, mm-hmm. right? Because if the ball is trying to go, you know, backwards and my hands on the other, like on the wrong side of it, the ball is going to fly out of my hand. Yeah. And so it's really important to kind of understand that. And there's drills and things that you can do as well. Like a lot of people don't know this, but when you just want to do a one-hander, you have to push the ball into your right hand and keep your right hand on top of the, if you're dunking with your right hand, mm-hmm. use your left hand to push the ball into the opposite hand. And that's how you keep your hand on top of it and mm-hmm. finish dunks pretty easily. I have a, a video on YouTube. It's called a like learn dunk technique. Yeah. And it's all like ball handling type type drills. And you literally just mess around with them and like learn you. It teaches you how to use momentum, how to move the ball around your body. Yeah. And it teaches you how to finish dunks super well, how to transfer the ball properly. And you can get super consistent with with those dunks. Wow. That's like something I never understood until you get into those really high level dunks. Like for me, it was natural to do a one hander. But then as I got to like a windmill or an East Bay, which is between the legs, those dunks like are increasingly difficult. And so those little nuances that you don't notice when you're just doing a one-hander or two-hander mm-hmm. make a huge difference when you're trying to go between your legs or in his case, go behind your back and then between your legs, you know, and then mm-hmm. while spinning, like having your hand in the right position and pushing the ball the correct way at the right time is really, really important. One of the biggest mistakes people make at dunking off the dribble is that they don't do what he was saying earlier and that's punch the ball upwards because it's like, some guys will walk up and they'll just kind of like keep it between their legs and just jump and then they then they bring the ball upward. But it's really important to time that up with what is his block foot and drive the ball upward at the right time because it's like it's, it gives you a little jolt of momentum off the floor and it helps yeah. you convert your horizontal momentum to vertical momentum. So knowing those little nuances goes a long way for someone who might be close or have the vertical or they're like, oh, but I can't palm the ball. Mm-hmm. You probably can still dunk if you can get, what do you think, your wrist over the rim? Yeah, I would say like a, most of your hand, maybe like a couple inches down on your yeah. wrist. And that's without finish. being able to Which palm I it. I think I can do that, but I still can't dunk. That's a <laughs> skill. That's where you're lacking. And you're, yeah. you're uh, hitting your head on the rim sometimes <laughs> all the way to the point where you said you've had stitches and stuff, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know which videos some of that might be? Or yeah, if if you go on my Instagram, it's one of the videos I have pinned. pinned. It's yeah. jumping over two people. You hit your on head on the other. rim. Man, yeah, it's just that's that's a different types of problems, man. We, we really right. haven't looked at enough of Isaiah's dunks because we this is kind of disgusting. Dude. This has to be an incredible <laughs> feeling. You're you're at a high school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This got to be so cool. You can go to any high school in the world in the world in the country and pull this shit off, and people are gonna flip out, right? Mm. Yeah, right there. It, oh, it's honestly one of the God. most surreal uh, feelings ever. Like that that experience, and especially at dunk camp, you have everybody in that gym uh around you mm-hmm. and they're waiting for like this one moment it lasts the entire approach and jump lasts one second but there's so much energy like that goes into it and it's just like you're just ready to go man all the adrenaline and power did that, is crazy did that energy ever kind of cripple your legs a little bit you ever have that happen um in, or, in what way like, like almost like uh i don't know kind of knock the wind out of you a little bit or, or make you feel um, overexcited Nervous? A, a little bit. The um, transition was probably, it probably took a while to build up to where there's this many people fired up. But Yeah, yeah. Uh, it happens, like, if I'm too overly nervous, like, uh, my legs will literally, like, start, like, <laughs> like shaking and stuff like that. And there's been times where I think I've gotten hurt because it was almost, like, my muscle, too many of my muscle fibers were, like, firing at the same time. Like, yeah. Um, my body felt like... I weighed a million pounds a couple of times when I got in front of some big crowds and it was really yeah. wild. I could barely like move my legs, but after I calmed down after a minute, I calmed down. Yeah. But it it's, was hard to breathe. What makes that really tough uh, is like caffeine. Like I remember I did a, the dunk contest that I just did on Monday. I, I don't drink coffee. I don't drink energy drinks, any of that stuff. The day of that contest, I drank an entire bang energy drink. That's why <laughs> it's 250 milligrams of caffeine in the morning. I did the dunks. 
uh, went to the semifinals and finals in the afternoon. Drank another bang oh, energy drink. He didn't need that. That that went <laughs> that went down. Then I was in the finals and I drank a cup of coffee. <laughs> that, was, that was my suggestion. I don't yeah. know if I would do it again, but I did really well in this dunk competition. They were interviewing me afterwards, and I was literally like, "What are they saying to me?" <laughs> like, I like, yeah, and I was like, it took like two days for my adrenaline to finally like calm down, and I was uh, like, "You might still be adrenalinated from that singular." <laughs> Session, yeah, probably 500 probably. milligrams of caffeine. So yeah. what was what was the strategy behind drinking all this caffeine when you Man. don't usually do that? The, the more caffeine I have in my system, the higher I jump. Like <laughs> it's literally like, it's like a cartoon, cartoon character, bro. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like we were talking about the sensu bean. Yeah. yeah, it's like a sensu bean. Yeah. You take it, you're like, oh. it definitely helps a lot. Stimulants, they go crazy. That's There's crazy. rumors about like some of the world record holders. Oh, not world record holders, but like elite high jumpers, like doing crazy stimulants and i'm not going to list which stimulant but it involves a line and they their vertical goes crazy uh because it's just such a super potent stimulant like your mm -hmm. nervous system is just revved mm. out of your mind um yeah. so that was the idea behind it and these events can be what i mean what was that 10 hours the one on monday was not nine to six yeah Jeez. so you might you might get there warm Shit. up you know dunk for 30 minutes or whatever yeah. else and then you have four hours of nothing, and then you got to dunk again for another, you know, whatever, five to ten minutes, and then you got another four hours of interviews and whatever else, and then you got to do it. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever, have you ever done a sport where that was, the, is powerlifting ever like <laughs> that at high, like at big meets? or It takes a long time, yeah. Yeah? So do you, like, get there and you do your it's bench press and everyone goes through their bench press and you yeah. got four hours later, then you go through your squat? Yeah, you have to be very careful with your caffeine consumption. Yeah. yeah. So what and is, food I guess, and everything. I'm curious, like, what is your preference in a meet day like that? Like, if you were in his shoes... And now, and you were like, I got to drink my caffeine, you know, around these windows. What would you, how would you have spaced it out? Would you have taken a little bit each time? Would you have like drank a ton in the morning and then just wrote it out? Like what would be your approach? Normally what I did was just not have caffeine until, until I was like in the middle of the contest. Oh, really? Because so you'd be like first set of squats, you come back, yeah, chug some caffeine. Yeah. I knew once I started moving around some weights in the weight in the warm up room and stuff like that, that I would get excited anyway and be fired up. So I was like, maybe I don't need it. And I try to push it off. And then sometimes, you know, I would take it like during bench, you know, a little bit before bench press or something. And then by the time the deadlift came around, I'd be flat. So it was important that I like try to time it to where I just had it mainly for the deadlift just because, mm -hmm. you know, just it, it, the whole day is like is draining. And, right. um, you know, as much as you like to get sleep for it or whatever, you don't always sleep the best the night before. And then there's also just the fact that the contest takes a really long time and you don't have anything that mimics anything like that. Yeah. You know, you, you, you do this heavy lift at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning and then you do a heavy deadlift at like 7 p.m. or something. It's, it's just it's just weird. You're yeah. like, I don't have any clue on how to prepare for this. Something that a lot of people don't see with professional dunking, too, is traveling and jet lag. Mm. Like I, I just recently did an event in Romania. Oh, uh, this was, I want to say three weeks ago and the entire travel day from the time I left my house to go to the airport lasted 26 hours. So 26 hours later, I've, I've been up and I'm in Romania and I, then when I get there, you're jet lagged and then I get probably like three, four hours of sleep, mm. uh, at night. Yo. And then you're expected to perform your very best to jump as, as high as possible. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the things people, people don't understand when they're watching these dunks that mm -hmm. these guys are doing. Yeah. Yeah. How do you get judged on the dunks? Like, it's so weird. Like <laughs> I can't, God. it kind of reminds me of like pro bodybuilding at a certain point or some that of is, these bodybuilding shows, like your girlfriend's getting ready for a show. Yeah. When you watch these people, it's like, that person looks really good. And you're like, that person looks amazing. Oh my God. That mm -hmm. person has... Yeah. Wait, I think that person's biceps are big. It's like hard to yeah. pick yeah. apart. What was the dunk contest, by the way, that got totally made fun of? I think it was last year or the year before. Where where Dwayne Wade like, gave it a nine. Yeah. That one. Yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's so common. And this is one of the things Isaiah actually, for a period of time, he didn't want to compete because he would go to these contests. And on paper, there are dunks that are objectively harder to do, right? And these judges come in here and they don't have shit. Mm -hmm. It's like... Like you have some celebrity or like hip hop artist or something that has never dunked a basketball and they're like, Yeah, that looks cool, it's entertaining. Ten. And meanwhile, that was the easiest dunk ever. He like there's a thing called a push off. Anytime the ball's on someone's back of their neck or their head, you can push off. That is like 
borderline cheating. Imagine if you could hold on to something and pull yourself up in powerlifting. You'd be like, that's cheating. You should be penalized. But for some reason, because it's entertainment, they we need that to be a part of the sport. But finding deductions and things like that, people don't know any better. So mm. they see that and they're like, oh, he jumped over someone and like put it behind his head. Like, oh, that should be a 10. No, he pushed off that person and it made a way easier uh. to make that dunk. That should be a seven. <laughs> so Isaiah would go to these events. And I mean, I don't know how many times we've seen him just get screwed over because of the scoring and is there anything in place at all to like where they have you know because yeah. like in like fig say figure skating like in figure skating you're supposedly supposed to give the judges your routine and then when you don't hit some of those things like is there any pre-planned like these are the seven dunks that i'm probably going to do and then you get judged based off of like, oh, that was supposed to be a 360 whatever. Yeah, right. And he fucked that up pretty bad. So he's going to get a five. So I'm actually working with Kador Ziani. Um, Our boy. Our guy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we love we, Kador. We uh, created this thing called the World Dunk Association. And we got like basically all the pro dunkers and amateur dunkers together. And we are coming up with basically a scoring system. Um, also, my little brother is helping in writing, cool. writing all the all the rules for that. And the idea of it is that every dunk has a certain complexity score. So if I do a between the legs dunk, that might be like a seven complexity score. If somebody does a behind the back, that might be an eight. Then the other categories are vertical, style, and finish. So finish, you want to be uh, dunking the ball as cleanly as possible with as much power as possible, trying to break the rim. Vertical is how high you jump or how far you're jumping. And then style is how cool does it look as you're flying through the air. I think if you do like a half-ass dunk, if it's like a little bit like a layup, you should just be eliminated. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Boom, oh, yeah. out. No, no power Go layups. On. No power layups. <laughs> yeah, you got to get the, the finish. That yeah. you a zero goose egg. But, but yeah, that's you want to you wanna finish dunks as powerfully as possible to get the high score. Mm. Is there any duck that's dunk that's been like elusive for you? Like a dunk that you've been trying to get and you're just like, this bitch is right here. The 360 double between the legs. It, is that, like has that been going on? done by somebody? Mm. Or? Uh, no. No one has done it. Someone's done it on 9.8 with a small ball yeah. uh, without the 360. Where is the video of you trying it? on 9.9 nine, or is like a joke borderline is it on your instagram 360 yeah. double double with french fries is that what you said yeah <laughs> you in and out oh, that sounds so good. <laughs> yeah. oh i can't wait to go to yeah. him yo get um, mr beast burger on doordash I'm mr not beast burger yeah just just get the mr beast burger on doordash the patties are fucking good anyway oh the the 360 oh, double double man yeah, we anyway. had a great burger the other day in santa barbara finney's do you ever guys ever go to finney's never had it. you never should heard. go to finney's it was incredible shout out finney's They'll make sure to try. I was it out. not paid to say that, <laughs> <laughs> but it was just good. Three sixty double double. So, huh? do you know where? Do you know where? Uh, I did a on low rims the last video I posted, I believe, on I'm Instagram. Sorry, or I second, just found this. I don't know. Is that no? I, that's three, go, no, go back to both. the main. That is a really hard dunk. I was gonna say it looks like. Oh, a three, go, scroll, scroll down. Scroll down. A little more. A little more. Right there on the very left. I don't think I'm yeah. a low rimmer. <laughs> you could be a low rimmer. What are you thinking, see my low rimmer? Woo! Oh, oh shit. That is coveted. That is this dunk. The holy grail. For, for perspective, when I, was, oh my God. when I was like 14, a between the legs was like the hardest dunk anyone yeah. could do, right? So 15 years ago, between the legs was impossible. There were guys that were doing 360 between the legs, but you wouldn't see it. It was almost a one guy. It was probably uh, air up there. Air up there, yeah. An and one, it. old and one dunker. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, after that, it became a little bit more popular. What, what he's doing is called a transfer. So anytime the ball moves from one hand to the other, it's called a transfer. So when you have two transfers, the dunk is like basically taking two dunks and lumping them together. Yeah. And then to do that with a 360 is like taking three dunks and lumping it together. Mm -hmm. So a 360 is hard. A between the legs hard. A double between the legs is impossible. A double between the legs with a 360 is like <laughs> double impossible. That's beyond video game level. You yeah. would, there, I don't know if there's anyone in the NBA that would even get remotely close to just the transfer twice. You probably uh, dunked two basketballs before, right? I <laughs> actually have not. There's what? there's a few other dunkers that have though, mm. but I've never I tried remember it. Remember Gerald dunk. Wallace did two two balls and, mm. and oh, then he yeah. lost the dunk contest. Yeah, who do you think is the greatest uh dunker when it comes to like the NBA contest? Like or what are some of the better uh I have my pick. Zach Levine versus Aaron Gordon. Uh it's probably yeah. the, the best dunk contest of all time in the NBA. Uh Gerald Green, he's a beast. Vince Carter, I'll probably put him at number four. Where are you putting Derrick Jones Jr.? Oh, my gosh. 
He's <laughs> okay. Top top six. Derek Jones Jr. is in there, and then Derek uh, Jones Jr. is one of the freakiest dunkers. He is one of one of the freakiest athletes, probably yeah. in the NBA that no one really knows about. Mm. Yeah, he can do. He, Damn, in game stuff is amazing too. Yeah, Ja Morant oh is God, probably is crazy. Oh, oh yeah, this is it right here. He flies. Whoa! Oh. <laughs> yeah, he takes <laughs> off. They, they call him airplane mode. Yeah, he's he's wow. unbelievable. Him and, and our favorite dunker right now is probably John Morant, right? You would say that's your favorite? Yeah, yeah. John he's, Morant will try to dunk on anybody. Yes, that's Isaiah. <laughs> when Isaiah plays pickup, he's just literally like, I love watching Ja and Zion because all they do is just dunk on people. I, I so call dunk. myself the LA Fitness Zion Williams. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever yeah, have you guys ever seen him play pick up basketball against people? Zion? No, 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 Isaiah. No, mm. I haven't. Oh, it is incredible. <laughs> if you can pull up a video of Isaiah playing pickup basketball. I don't know which one it is. There's one where he's playing at his, I guess like you're where you live in 29. Yeah. Is yeah. that the best one where you just dunk every single play? Bro, this happens it's five so many v five. Times. It's five v five, and Isaiah's just like every single. You'll see a shot occasionally, <laughs> but every play is just like drive dunk, drive dunk, drive dunk. It's like what we all. Oh, yeah, there here it you is. go. <laughs> it's just so it was a bunch of pro dunkers. We all got together, and everyone just wanted to dunk at at this like five v five. Yeah, and it was ridiculous keep in mind like la fitness is not you know college basketball do you know where the the highlights of this are oh uh, i have it was just the beginning of the video so oh, okay you're probably not this is most replayed. replayed guys probably just avoid letting you like letting you drive on them because they don't want to get posted yeah here's one yeah just crush oh it. yeah so that's like if you watch him play it's hilarious because that's his entire strategy is let me get close enough if i'm in the middle if he's in the middle of the paint he's probably gonna try to dunk yeah. Within that range, he's going to dunk on you, which That's is always insane. fun to watch. So, yeah, LA Fitness, Zion over here. <laughs> yeah. How, like, okay, so what is the highest recorded vert? How close are you to it? And how, how much more do you think you got? Because uh, you're in uncharted territory, right? Yeah. There's a lot of uh, unofficially recorded verticals out there. Um, Unsubstantiated claims. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think... The highest one that's like unofficial would would have been Kador, I guess, like in the early 2000s. He said his vertical is like 60 or something like that. It's never been backed by like video video evidence or anything. But from when you see his videos of him dunking, what do you like? Do you do you um, see that? I don't think I. He got I love Kador. Like <laughs> I love Kador. He's one of my favorite people to like talk to. But I don't think he. He probably would have tested on a Vertac like 47, 48, 49 really? in his prime. Yeah, I think so. And so like I am the most rigorous asshole when it comes to measuring your vertical because, <laughs> because so many people have made these crazy claims that are unsubstantiated. Mm. Imagine if someone was like, I squat 2,000 pounds and, there was, and they had a video of them doing it and there's no way to verify that they're legitimate plates or legitimate weights or maybe they measured one and then cut it and they made it seem like they did something. I'm like, unless I have seen it in person, I don't believe it because anyone can edit a video or claim mm. they touch a certain height or fudge mm. their reach and say that the vertical is something that it's not. Recently, there was a uh, an athlete from China and he claimed, and this is on my Instagram, he claimed he had a 53 inch vertical and the jump looks insane. It looks crazy. But to say 53 inches, I'm like, there's no way. Like there's no way that was 53 inches because I've seen the conglomerate of the greatest jumpers in the entire world. And there's no chance. So yeah, this is the video. They, they posted it. He goes up and, and touches what is 11, 11, or at least he says, but there's no way to know if that vertex leaning, there's no way to know what his reach is. And there's no way to know, uh, if that is actually 11, 11, like we have no way of telling. And so for me, it's like, unless I look at you and I look at your reach and I test your reach, I'm not going to believe you because it's easy to do this. If I reach up like this, I'm like, oh, that's my reach. Yeah, here, here we go. Uh, we'll stand, we won't stand close to the mic, brothers. Camera can't even see right it. <laughs> so if I'm if I'm like this and I'm like, oh, I'm reaching as hard as I can. There's like no way I can do this. Well, now I'm gonna actually reach, okay? And I'm gonna I'm gonna elevate my scapula. I'm gonna elevate my ribs, and I'm gonna like reach as hard as I can. Ooh. And so, then and then if I stretch. Now watch this. Yeah. <laughs> you go as hard as you can. Don't put your hand through the ceiling though. Oh shit! So, yeah. so you, you can you can like fudge your reach. I mean, really you saw easily. before my reach was lower than his, right? And out of the start, and he wasn't even reaching as hard as he could, right? So I probably gained a good four to five inches on my reach by like 
fudging it. And so mm-hmm. guys are like, well, my shoulder's really tight and I can't reach. And uh, that's why, so if, if you're going to take what they touch minus their standing reach and get it, well, the easiest way to do it is just to fudge your reach. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't do it. And they, in the combine, they do that. Like, they're just like, if, if I were coaching an NFL guy, I'd say, Hey, DK Metcalf, I want you to say you have shoulder issues and you can't reach for shit you know, and go up there and just pack that scap down as hard as you can and don't let them pull it. And they're going to lift you up, but let them lift up your whole body. That's yeah. how strong I want you to be. And then they go and test and they touch, you know, DK Metcalf, let's say he's 6'4", you know, and he uh, he touches 11 feet and they're like 48. And it's like, wait a second, you're 6'4", and you touched 11, let's say 11, 2, 11, 3, and you have a 48. He's six foot. So you're 6'4", he's six foot. He touches 12, 3, and he has a 50. So mm-hmm. he touched mm-hmm. what is 10 or 12, 13, whatever inches higher than you, but you're yeah. claiming that your vertical is 48 and his is also 48. Someone's not telling the truth here. Mm-hmm. Um, so in my opinion, like that, that's why I'm such a stickler. I'm like, unless I basically pull your shoulder out of socket <laughs> and I've seen it in person, it's not really valid to me. And right um, now your, your highest vert is 50. Uh, 50.5 inches, 50.5. What's yeah. the official world record? If that there is, one. is uh, 50, the official 25. world record. <laughs> that is the official I'm, world record. I am, I am nice. going to say with confidence that that is the official world record. The reason that it wouldn't be is because we didn't have like Guinness would be like, oh well, Guinness is the world record. It's like who said Guinness was valid? Like who was who was testing for Guinness or whatever else? Right. The only other guy that's close is a guy named uh, Darius Clark, mm-hmm. and he has the potential, I would say, to go higher than that, honestly. But he's never like I guess tested frequently enough to where he probably would have had it because he would just need one freaky day. And you'd probably do it, honestly. Yeah. And I've seen his reach. I've seen him reach he, as hard he's as He's tested a 50. He's tested a legit 50. I've never seen anyone other than these two test a legitimate. I've never seen anyone test a legitimate 48. A legitimate, or maybe Jay Clark. Jay Clark and maybe yeah. Kilgannon. Yeah. But like, it is so incredibly rare. And I've never even like stretched out Kilgannon to be able to say like, what is your actual reach in your LeBron 10s or whatever else? That's yeah. just out of respect. I'll just take his word for it. Mm-hmm. You know, but like, he, you know, his vertical is super freaking high. So we usually, what we do to verify it is we'll look at flight time. How long are you in the air? Because that, you can't fake that. You know what I mean? And then look at your height, look at what you touched yeah. and take all of those conglomerates to get an estimate on how accurate the value they're saying is. And so a lot of the time, as soon as you look at their flight time mm-hmm. out the window, you know, for a fact, it's not valid. And so you can obviously land in a lower configuration and fluff the number up. Mm-hmm. Like Isaiah's had a one second flight time. That's never been done ever by yeah. any athlete in the history of the world. Yeah. Um, but Isaiah landed in a really low position. And so that makes sense. If he lands in a normal, you know, landing position or whatever else, mm-hmm. it's like 0.97, which is, you know, 30 milliseconds, like that, that the mm-hmm. difference of that, yeah. you know, in, in the air. And so for me, I'm, I'm like, he has the high, he's the highest jumper in the world. Yeah. He is the highest jumper in the world until someone grabs a Vertec <laughs> and they have on video them reaching the hell out of their shoulder, yeah. you know, and saying on video, like, this is not me doing this. And, and then going up and touching what is a Vertec that's measured, measure the Vertec too. And then I'll look at the flight time and I'll verify it. Cause if I look at the flight time and you're like, I have a 50 inch vertical, but the flight time's 0.8. I'm like, you don't have a 50 inch vertical. You're yeah. not even close. Um, and obviously I would look at how they land and stuff, but My the guy, you are passionate about, dude, <laughs> you have no idea. Imagine, passionate. imagine if you had the world record for, for deadlift and some guys like, uh, no, it's actually me. And like, they're using 35 pound plates instead of 45 pound plates. And it's on video and they're like, well, I'm actually that guy. And it's like, yeah. well, no, you're not. Like I, I did it in this like competitive environment with all these other people. And so for us, it's like, you know, it all comes out in the wash. Yeah. You, you take someone out to, uh, to a contest or whatever else, we're going to see who the highest jumper is there. We're going to yeah. see, you know what I mean? And there's tons of freaks out there. There are probably guys that could test higher. You would think there's guys that could test higher than 50? I don't think so. Damn. No one has uh, the potential? You don't think anyone has sick. the potential? We got the, I don't, I don't mm. think so. Oh, I love That's that. a good place to end <laughs> it. Wait, wait. I, 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 got, I got to ask one more it. thing okay. because people who watch basketball or people who are in, uh, interested in dunking are curious about this. <laughs> shoes. How, like, what are your favorite dunking shoes and why why do you like why do you use those specific shoes? My my favorite shoes are the Kobe Sixes because they have amazing grip. Uh, they fit super well and they're low to the ground. Like I feel like I feel like I can feel the floor as I, as I'm jumping. And that makes a difference for you. Yeah, big time. All right. Off one foot, Jordan thirty six. I'll stand by that. <laughs> Even okay. though I'm not the highest jumper in the world. <laughs> oh, they're beautiful. Yeah. All right. They're also six hundred dollars. Oh, Fuck. They're not, <laughs> they're not giving them away. Nope. Mm-hmm. 
They do look good, though. <laughs> hey, make sure you like the video. I hope you guys have been sticking around the whole time. I know we talked for a long time. <laughs> but, it, you know, something like jumping, uh, there might be some lifters and some people that uh, maybe didn't respect this as much or whatever. But uh, to go out and be able to jump is a sign of, of, re of someone being really powerful and someone being really healthy. And so uh, yeah. hopefully from this video, hopefully you guys will, or from this podcast, you guys will be encouraged to mess around with some jumping. I'm fired up about it. I'm excited. I'm going to start mixing some in. I've been doing small amounts of it. And, um, you know, I all I can do is go up from here. Like it's harder <laughs> for you to make progress than it is for me at this yeah. point, right? Yeah, for Because sure. you're already at the top. Mm -hmm. Andrew, take us on out of here. Absolutely. Uh, for everything podcast really, just head over to powerproject.live. Got all the information that you need there. Make sure you guys like today's video on your way out and uh, subscribe. If you guys are not subscribed, uh, at MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z and SEMA. Where you at? Great review, guys. And that's the Discord. It's in the description. So at and SEMA Inning on Instagram, YouTube, and SEMA Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Isaiah John, where can people find you guys? Uh, you can find us at THP Strength on Instagram, or you can go to thpstrength.com uh, and sign up for some of the best jump training on the planet. I stand by that. Time for Smelly's tip. You guys ready for that? <laughs> cool. uh, it's, it's wow, really I'm so excited. Like, hey, hey, what hey. does that mean? <laughs> All right, just let's yep, go. The most important go. segment of the podcast. <laughs> A little more spit, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What, what did we sign up for? <laughs> yeah. Should we leave? <laughs> like, <laughs> should we get out of here? <laughs> Smelly's tip. Oh, God. <laughs> Uh, this morning I ran 11 miles with my buddy Oscar and, uh, you guys have been, some people have been following along with my running. You know, all I have to say is, um, you know, it's only taken me a couple months to get to this point, but, um, I've been running every day. I've been diligent with it, been taking my time with it. And I think, uh, much like the progression that we've seen you make over the years and the progression that you guys have made together, you put what, six inches on his jump in how, how long a period of time did that take? Four years. Three, uh, three and a half? Ten in, wait. Oh, no, wait. 27? Yeah, six six inches in four years. But he's already at an elite level, which is why that's super important. <laughs> like, it's super It's super important, yeah. and it's important to, like, hear that it took years, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the, people have the amount, delusional. They're delusional. Yeah, the amount, the amount you increased half a foot is just extremely <sighs> impressive. But I think what's really impressive is at a young age— you know, putting your own stuff on pause for a moment, saying, let me explore this. I think it will work out. And you rolled the dice and you ended up being right. So yeah. I want people to just spend more time in betting on themselves. Trust your gut instinct, as our boy Isaiah did here. I trusted my gut instinct. It led me down a lot of different great paths. This is my interest now is running. So I'm running all over the fucking place. <laughs> Follow your interest. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. Ooh. There we go. Yes, sir. Wow, yeah. that was awesome. Yeah. How long was so, this shit hit 240. Me at some point? I didn't want to mention it on air.